To our board members, please be reminded that for sound purposes, you must turn your microphone by tapping the touchpad. Speak directly into it for the sound to be audible, not only for our in-person community members here in the auditorium, but also for anyone listening to the live stream. After speaking, please also mute your microphone once again by pressing on the touchpad. Mr. McGuinn, would you please take the roll call of the board? Certainly. Dr. Cohen. Present. Mrs. Baker. Present. Mr. Patton. Present. Mr. Steinberg. Mr. Berardi. Present. Mr. Geiger. Present. Mr. Kazatsky. Ms. Natter. Present. Mr. Walbranski. Present. There are seven board members uh, in attendance tonight. Thank you, Mr. McGuinn. I'll take the roll call of the cabinet members and administrators who will be participating in tonight's meeting. Mrs. Galdo. Present. Mrs. Drennan. Present. Mr. McGuinn. Here. Mr. Giordano. Here. Dr. Hilt. Here. Mr. Miles. Ms. Dilks. Here. Mr. Cole. Here. Mr. Highland. Here. Thank you. So for purposes of public comment and questions this evening, which will take place near the end of this evening's agenda, all public speakers are asked to state their first and last name prior to addressing the board. A three minute time period will be allowed for individual comments. Individuals may not yield their time to another speaker. All comments will be directed to the board as a whole or to the presiding officer. Uh, no comments or questions shall be directed to individual board members or district administrators. When applicable, responses to questions asked during the public will be answered. All public comments and responses must be in the spirit of civil public discourse. Abusive or profane language will not be tolerated. Please be aware that all comments are being recorded and the board thanks the public in advance for its cooperation. So to begin uh, this evening, before we get into a couple of presentations that we do have, I certainly want to recognize our LMTSD staff, our teachers. This is Teacher Appreciation Week. And we celebrate Teacher Appreciation Week by recognizing the hard work and, con and contributions our teachers make in the lives of our students. Our teachers' commitment to supporting and developing student success is special. Most importantly, during these unprecedented times, our teachers have quickly adjusted to new ways of teaching and connecting with students. And it's in these challenging times that we continue to recognize and appreciate how our teachers play such a pivotal role in our students' lives. So on behalf of the Lower Moreland Township School District and certainly of the Board of, Direc of School Directors, I want to thank all Lower Moreland Township School District teachers for your dedication, compassion, and instilling a love of learning in our students. And today we had a few special treats around our buildings for, for our staff and I know our PTA groups are also celebrating our teachers throughout this week and providing some things as well. So congratulations to our teachers and certainly you are very much appreciated most certainly not only during this week but all weeks of the school year. Next, uh, just a little bit of update. Um, high school rankings by U.S. News and World Report did come out, uh, I believe it was last Tuesday that they were reported out. Um, the rankings include Lower Moreland High School, uh, 23rd in the state of Pennsylvania, 851st nationally ranked. And I just want to remind in, um, our community and our teachers, and it's, it's a very nice thing to certainly celebrate that ranking structure for our school district. I think it really um, tells the tale of a K through 12 experience here in Lower Moreland Township School District, not just our high school teachers providing that great education, but all of our teachers um, providing that through the landscape of our students. Um, the breakdown of rankings is really highly dependent upon a lot of AP testing. So I think we have to also be at the same time a little bit of somewhat cautionary when you look at rankings and look behind the scenes as to what kind of data points really make up the ranking systems. Um, if you know anything about advanced placement courses these days, less and less colleges are really accepting the three, four, and five score, score rankings um, uh, throughout. And we have less and less students actually taking APs uh, because of some of that. The data that was used in the rankings uh, came from the 2018-2019 school year. So it usually lags a couple of years till they're able to put together all the data points for this. 
So 40% is made up through the amount of 12th graders, so the class of 2019, who took and earned a qualifying score on at least one AP or IB, International Baccalaureate exam, earning a qualifying score is worth three times more than just taking it and so forth. So calculations are made through that way. And um, another, temp, uh, so another part of that is also the proportions of that same grade who took and earned a qualifying score on an AP or an IB exam in multiple areas. So the more, essentially the more exams you took, the greater, uh, it, it, greater percentages and the greater scoring that you got. So within that ranking system, there's about six, six or seven other school districts ahead of us that um, completely offer only AP and IB uh, course loads um, due to the fact that they're selective schools, they're STEM schools, or they're application-only schools, or something along those lines to which it is. So essentially ranking in, in that 23rd spot in and among, I think, some great Montgomery County school districts is something that we can really be proud of. Certainly something we want to continue to build on. We continue to look at the types of courses that we're offering, the types of students that are taking the AP classes. Are we placing and are we challenging our students to take some of those accelerated classes? And we'll continue to do a lot of that. The other portion of ranking uh, came through the other 60% was with our math and reading proficiencies um, throughout this, what they calculate through our state scores, those keystone exams. And we scored very, very well within that. 90% in the, 95% I think in the reading section and, and in the upper 80s in the math section. And then another portion of percentage comes through the graduation rate, which we have an extremely high graduation rate, nearly 99% graduation rate when it comes to that. So again, something wonderful for our community to, to stand behind and celebrate, and some things that we can also build upon as we move forward um, in that. All right. So we're going to start off with our presentations this evening, and we're going to start with Mr. McGuinn. And I know you have a presentation this evening on the superintendent memorial update, and I know this was something Mr. Steinberg had asked us to look into, and Mr. McGuinn has been tasked with charging that for the district. Thank you, Dr. David Heiser. Um, I actually have three other up really quick updates beyond that. but. Uh, in uh, conversation with Mrs. Drennan and I, uh, as we were uh, definitely had the pleasure of knowing and um, enjoying Dr. Archibald's tenure here at uh, Lower Moreland Township School District, uh, we've preliminarily mapped out a plan. We'll probably be touching base with a few staff members at the beginning of next school year uh, to develop a small committee to um, work out a plan for a memorial as it relates to uh, the building of the new school. Uh, we don't foresee it being done until the new school is done, so we do have a little bit of time. Uh, so if any of our board members are in contact with Mr. Steinberg, if you can let him know that uh, we are on it and we are working uh, forward on that. Uh, I did want to update the board uh, on the status um, of our food service activity. As you recall, when Mr. Vollmer was here and presenting his budget uh, last month, we were about $20,000 in the hole uh, through February. That has been made up. We're about now $11,000 in the hole through March. We still see an upward trend, uh, and we are hopeful to, uh, at, at, at the very least, break even or get very close to that uh, in this challenging year. Um, something else that I want to update the board on Contrary to the board approving the prices for school lunches next year, the USDA has announced that once again for the entire school year of 2021-22, all meals will be free. Uh, so we will be doing some of the same type of setups. Uh, uh, the high level information from the uh, USDA has been uh, announced, however, uh, our Division of Food and Nutrition has not been able to disseminate that information to the school districts as of yet. So as soon as we get a better handle on how that will look next year, uh, we will certainly be communicating that out. But uh, again, we will continue to serve through this summer uh, as the board approved at last meeting. And again, next year, all meals will be free. Um, will the uh, government be, be subsidizing us for that? I, I'm sorry, Dr. Cohen, I could not understand you. It, will the government be subsidizing us for all the uh, lunches? Will the government be subsidizing 
The government, yes, I'm sorry, Dr. Cohen. Yes, the government reimburses districts a certain um, amount per meal. So uh, as we spoke of uh, last month, the challenge has been our expenses have been exceeding what we've been receiving from the federal government. We've gotten preliminary word that they are increasing the amount uh, per meal that a district would be reimbursed for. Once again, we do not have any of the specific information as soon as we get that. Uh, we will pass that along. Um, so that, that was the third part of my update. My last update is Standard & Poor's, our bond rating agency, uh, released its bond rating for us and surprisingly downgraded the district from AA plus to AA, simply for one reason only, and that is because we are issuing more debt. Um, we had a follow-up phone call where uh, a very agitated Mr. McGuinn was um, trying to seek that explanation and their only uh, response to that was, well, your reserves need to be bigger. I said, well, our reserves are capped at a certain percentage based on uh, the size of our district. Uh, and pretty much they continued to say the only reason that your rating was downgraded was because you were issuing more debt to build a new school. So, uh, again, we, we received that information so it was released today, and we posted it in uh, as a continuing disclosure on the federal website. So once again, we've, we've been downgraded from AA plus to AA. Still a very good rating, um, but it's something that was very much unexpected. Mark, pardon the interruption. Will that affect our borrowing? In, in conversations with Mr. Shearer from Public Financial Management, it will probably affect us about five basis points. That's what he, and it's, the numbers are still gonna be well within what they are projecting or what they showed us uh, and, at budget uh, time. We are working with Janney Montgomery. Uh, they were the winning RFP uh, uh, underwriter for this issue. So they are working on uh, pricing. We have kind of a, sort of a parameters resolution and they will be locking in prices most likely next week. And, and there are other bond rating agencies besides Standard & Poor's. Uh, there are. Can Mo we get Moody's a, is the a second other, opinion? <laughs> yeah, Moody's is the other um, agency uh, for our next rating. We may uh, either turn to Moody's or maybe look to have a, uh, a dual rating to see you know, what Moody's thinks of us. Uh, as I, again, and unfortunately, Mr. Venencial was not on, is not in attendance, but he happened to be in my office uh, when we went through the rating call. And for the hour plus conversation with the analyst was never brought up. Our amount of reserves was never brought up. The fact that we spelled out exactly how we were going to fund the new building at our previous rating call was known. So again, when we appealed, my argument was, what has changed? You knew what was coming. And again, they just kept going back to our debt ratio as it relates to the amount of reserves that we have on hand. Thank you. So I'm gonna have Dr. Hilt set up our next presentation. Um, in the interim, I just wanted to give the board a uh, COVID-19 update. Again, um, the county itself is still in the substantial, what they, they denote as the substantial range. Um, today's numbers I pulled were an incidence rate of 133 per 100,000 with a 6.9% uh, positivity rate. And, and that's kind of plateaued there. We've dipped a little below that. There's been a little bit of a rise, but it's been holding in that 6 to 7% uh, positivity rate. So. Um, the virus is still out there. Some of the strains that are um, out there, again, um, our, our, our hope is that with more vaccines, and it does sound uh, promising um, to the fact that uh, age 12 and up, possibly within the next week, might be released. And that might be something that we can also include in our uh, clinics moving forward. Um, and we have successfully run one round of the first dose for our 16 and up and that second dose will be coming on the 15th. Um, here in Lower Moreland, through our attestation form and requirements with the state, we have a 14-day rolling period. We have seven cases at the high school, six cases at Murray Avenue, 
five at Pine Road. And again, that's a 14 day rolling. So cases come on, cases come off across that. We did see a little bit of flux. Um, you know, and I've, I've noted in many of my communications thus far that through each of those positives, we have an average of approximately 10 to 15 close contacts when it comes to elementary students, and anywhere from 15 to 20, if not larger, when it comes to, um, to secondary students. And that's just due to the nature of those secondary students changing classes throughout the course of the day, thereby being around other people and within that six foot uh, distance that it is now. Now, there was uh, information that did come out uh, today. You probably heard the announcement from the Wolf Administration and in coordination with the COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force. They announced that several mit mitigation orders will be lifted in Pennsylvania beginning on Monday, May 31st, Memorial Day. Uh, it's important to note that the order requires universal face coverings. The, the order that requires universal face coverings will not be lifted until 70% of Pennsylvanians age 18 and older are fully vaccinated. In addition, today's announcement will not impact municipalities with, with stricter mitigation efforts. So in, in, in short, that could mean that the Montgomery County Department of Health, who were under uh, the supervision of could be um, more strict if they're lifting all of the mitigation orders except for the masking. Um, Montgomery County, we're going to have to see how that plays out, whether they're going to keep contact tracing in and whether or not they'll be uh, quarantining related to to that as a, as, a, as a mitigation order or not. So stay tuned on that. We'll be finding more things out, I'm sure, in the next week or two from the County Department of Health. So what's that going to mean for our school community here? The attestation process uh, for public schools will expire then on Memorial, on Memorial Day. And that attestation process is really us communicating about the types of cases we have based on the size buildings we have. We're in touch then with the County Department of Health to determine whether a building has to close for any length of period of time, whether we've seen transmission, whether we've not seen transmission, and whether we can remain open. To date, we've really not seen any transmission in our buildings, so we've been fortunate, even though we've met some metrics based on the size buildings we have, um, we've still been able to maintain uh, and, and remain open, even while, um, you know, quarantining a, a large amount of students through close contacts, uh, but we've still been able to be functional as, a, as an in-person buildings throughout. With this um, new, newest order, um, which will re pull those off, that attestation process will no longer be um, in order. But I'm certain the, uh, the county health department will re really rely on still an investigation process through those last couple weeks of school as to whether or not we see, we're seeing any transmission. And that's certainly the last thing they want to have happen is to have a super spreader on their hands in, in one of our buildings. Um, and if we can mitigate that at any point in time, um, we will try to do that. So also then, uh, in addition, event and gathering limitations are going to be lifted. Um, and that's an interesting um, time period for that to be lifted with a lot of graduations and things like that happening. Uh, it shouldn't impact our graduation in any way, shape, or form. We're still involving an outdoor graduation. We want to maintain that. We're, we can still um, include the same amount of tickets for our family members that we could if we were housed in here for the graduation, which is four per family member. So the impact of that is not really going to be felt unless we get a deluge of rain throughout the week of uh, June the 7th and we just can't host anything outdoor during that particular week in which we have to come inside here. Um, and then we'll have to think of plan B when it comes to how many other guests uh, we might be able to fit in here and fit in here safely um, during that time period. Okay, so that's the COVID update for Pennsylvania and here in Lower Moreland. Dr. Hill, okay. So the purpose for our next presentation is to share information related to the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund. Uh, many of you may have heard of this as the ESSER fund. In 2020, nearly a year ago, and in 2021, Congress passed three stimulus bills that provided nearly $190.5 billion to the elementary and secondary emergency relief uh, fund, ESSER. 
states receive funds based on the same proportion that each state receives under the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, the ESSA, Title I. States must distribute at least 90% of funds to local education agencies, LEAs, meaning school districts, based on their proportional share of ESSA Title I funds. States have the option to reserve 10% of the allocation for emergency needs as determined by the state to address issues responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities CARES Act passed on March 27, 2020 provided $13.5 billion to the ESSER Fund. The Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act in 2021 passed on December 20, 27, 2020, provided $54.3 billion in supplemental ESSER funding known as the ESSER II Fund. The American Rescue Plan Act passed on March 11, 2021, provided $122.7 billion in, dollars in supplemental ESSER funding known as the ESSER III Fund. State education associations are required to reserve their allocations to carry out activities to address learning loss, after school activities, and summer learning plans. The school districts must reserve at least 20% of the funding they receive to address learning loss. Two thirds of ESSER funds are immediately, have been immediately available to states, while the remaining funds will be available after states submit ESSER implementation plans. So again, just to remind our board, Title I allocations provide financial assistance to local school districts for children from low-income families to help ensure that all children meet challenging state academic standards. And that's the formula that's used then to distribute these fundings. So to date, we've had three stimulus packages that have provided substantial monies to school districts. Um, the first, ESSER I, Again, that one that was developed back on May 4th of 2020, nearly a year ago, Lower Moreland Township School District received $79,831, to which those monies have been already been allocated toward all the things that I just referenced. Tonight's focus in its presentation will be on the ESSER II and the ESSER III funds. Lower Moreland Township School District received $317,320 for the ESSER II fund. And under ESSER, and under ESSER III, which still has not opened yet as a grant opportunity, but will, and they're proposed that it should be sometime mid-May, Lower Moreland Township School District will, or is expected to receive, $652,717. So all three ESSER uh, 1, 2, and 3 funds total $1,049,868, to which 20% needs to be dedicated toward learning loss here in the district. So tonight's presentation, I'm going to be utilizing the entire cabinet who will be participating from their seats. Uh, the orchestrator to this will be Mrs. Drennan, who's taking the lead as Director of Curriculum and Instruction to share with you our plan for the spending on the ESSER II and ESSER III funds and some of the requirements that are regulated and, re and needed in the ESSER III funding as it relates to uh, public review of this. Mrs. Dren. So as Dr. David Heiser stated, the entire cabinet has uh, made contributions to this presentation tonight, and we're going to start with Mr. McGuinn to explain the financial aspects of ESSER II and ESSER III. Thank you, Mrs. Drennan. Um, as everyone has heard Dr. David Heiser say, uh, we are slated and have already received a very good amount of money However, what is very important to understand, and, and I'll have a quote on the next page, is this is one-time money. So districts have been, honestly, they've been warned by, Leonard, by senators of the, of the uh, Pennsylvania Senate, leaders in the Pennsylvania Senate, not to put recurring expenditures against your federal stimulus dollars. Back in 2008, 2009, uh, with the crash of, uh, of the market in October of 2008, uh, 
President Obama uh, enacted uh, AARA funds. Uh, and what many districts uh, uh, made the mistake of is utilizing those funds to uh, offset their um, spending costs in their general budget. Uh, we will not be doing that as, as we will talk about what has already been spent and our planned expenditures as we move along. Uh, again, here is a direct quote from a letter that was sent to all superintendents. It's a pretty powerful letter. Um, I, I'm certainly not going to read it verbatim, uh, but as you can see, um, we have all the state senators who are in charge of the educational funding uh, and the educational committees in Harrisburg warning you uh, federal stimulus money should be ex appropriately be expended for one-time purchases. Please. So really quickly, uh, the unbolted uh, uh, bullet points are grants that we've already received or, and or we've already applied for. Uh, the first grant, $38,000, was used to reimburse the district uh, after uh, the uh, end of March of 2020, we had a company come in and disinfect head to toe all three of our buildings. We received 75% of those costs back from a FEMA grant, or I'm sorry, a PEMA grant. Uh, a PCCD, Pennsylvania Crimes and Commissions um, uh, Division, gave 207,000. The district used that for one-to-one uh, -one, uh, computing, personal protective equipment, uh, and distance learning uh, setups so that we could effectively get the school year running with our, our teachers uh, teaching on a dual platform. The first ESSER grant, as Dr. David Heiser mentioned, 79,000, once again went toward reimbursing the district for PPE and more district learning equipment. The, the county uh, received funds that were distributed through the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit. The district, our district was allocated a little over 131000 We offset those costs as part of the first uh, stimulus package, a granite leave for teachers. Teachers were allowed to uh, essentially stay at home uh, and not teach, and the district had to replace those teachers with long-term subs. We did that and offset our costs to the tune of 131,000. Uh, the next grant was a mitigation equity grant. This is to be used to make up for learning loss for our special needs students uh, for compensated education. That grant has an ex expiration date of uh, September 30th, 2021. Uh, we are working closely with Mr. Giordano and his folks in, in the special education department uh, to apply for services that have been missed uh, and, being, and, and are being made up to make sure that our special education uh, youngsters meet his or her IEP. So we will uh, be applying those funds against those grants. The COVID-19 Part 2 grant uh, through the PCCD uh, was again for more personal protective equipment. This was also used. Um, we, re we were reimbursed for extra daytime cleaning services. While students were in the building, we had um, daytime porters at all three of our buildings, and we still do, uh, wiping down high-touch areas uh, to ensure uh, that everything remains disinfected. As I mentioned, the last two grants are what we'll be speaking of next, and those are the two that we have not applied for, but those are the allocations that have been um, afforded Lower Moreland Township School District. As Dr. David Heiser said previously, the ESSER funds stand for Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. Um, ESSER 3 is uh, actually named the American Rescue Plan. That is the larger of the two grant awards. And because of its size, in particularly, there are a number of requirements, one of them being that our plan for the use of ESSER 3 funds be made public, presented in public, and then on display for 30 days. And it also requires a 20% allocation to learning loss. So I wanted to take a moment just to discuss learning loss versus schooling loss. Learning loss is quickly becoming somewhat of a polarizing um, phrase. It's being used in a lot of different settings. 
Uh, in school districts where students throughout this period of time did not have access to technology or high quality materials, learning loss is a very real thing. Uh, this district put devices in the hands of students right away, turned uh, around in one weekend, tablets in the hands of elementary students, Chromebooks in the hands of elementary students who didn't have it. Our teachers have been engaging with students who are in person or in a virtual setting throughout the closure last year and this entire year. And I think it's important to celebrate the fact that in Lower Moreland Township School District, we've been fortunate that while our students have not physically been in school with us five days a week, they have been learning every day. So I, I think what we need to, what we might caution ourselves to be mindful about is to celebrate that with our kids and not have them feel like they are entering next year, let's say, behind. There are differences in the learning that occurred this year compared to what may have occurred last year or the year before. But what we've really lost here is schooling, the traditional sense of schooling. And schooling in and of itself, being physically in a building, does not ensure learning. Um, but it does ensure peer-to-peer -peer interactions, socialization, support from interface with teachers. And so as we approach how we're spending our funds, we want to focus on what we can do to recoup the schooling loss as well as any students who have struggled or perhaps are in danger of falling behind based on the situation that we've been in for the last year and a half. Another way to look at this would be the difference between a growth mindset versus a deficit mindset. We're trying to approach this from a proactive and really supportive standpoint. So we worked as a cabinet team um, and we made decisions about the grant allocations based on an academic return on investment protocol. We also interfaced with um, PDE's resources. They went through and curated a number of resources that districts can use when allocating their funds. And we decided that the priority areas for the district would be students, so funds would be utilized for the support of social and emotional well-being and academic progress. COVID-19, so um, either reimbursing or allocating funds to the implementation of our health and safety plan. And diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, helping us to become a more culturally proficient school community. So these were the priority areas. And the cabinet worked together to determine what priorities in each of the um, separate categories might exist and how we could allocate funds to reach the greatest number of our students. So the first area that we looked at was curriculum and instruction. And we've acknowledged that we've had an increased number of students this year needing academic support. Students have struggled with work completion, engagement, executive functioning, we have data points at the middle and high school level in particular that show that there are uh, students who in a prior year may have been earning better grades and they're now struggling differently. And we are recommending that we create a position for an intervention specialist who will work with students identified by teachers in the IST team because they're in danger of falling behind. We'll use benchmark assessments and analyze the data in ELA and math specifically to identify any learning loss that does exist. And we'll follow the IST referral process and put supports into place for regular education students who need a boost, who need sort of a case manager to allow them to continue to reacclimate to the school, um, to schooling essentially, and to continue to thrive. We're asking for three, two and a half positions of a teacher on special assignment, which means it will take someone who is our own staff member, who knows our students, and has been a part of our school community, and we'll assign them to be an intervention specialist for one year. The funds allocated here will pay for those teachers' salaries because they're the ones doing the work of the intervention specialists, and then we'll hire long-term substitutes to replace them in the classroom for the year. Um, and we hope that this support will provide what students need for a safety net to be able to um, prevent them from falling behind, but also to close any gaps that might exist when they return to us. Mrs. Drennan, just a point, the, the number shown is also inclusive of benefits. 
Yes, so when writing the grant, we um, needed to identify the people doing the work. It also captures someone who's on the higher end of our pay scale, so ultimately, depending on who the individual is, that number could be less than anticipated. Ms. Dredd, I have a, a couple questions. What data are we using now to determine that students have not experienced um, loss in, in learning? At the elementary levels, um, K through six, grades K through six, we've used iReady benchmarking, and we compared last year's mid-year benchmark to this year's mid-year benchmark. Um, in the prior year, we had about 10% of our students that were engaged in title services, and this year, about 10% seem to have dropped a level in iReady, so it's holding about the same. So are we seeing the same with the younger grades? I'm thinking like K1 and two. I would think they experienced the most loss. So for K, there's no comparison to last year, and they're de determining kind of progress in their daily assignments and in their classwork. And in grade one, we also do not have benchmark data, so they also are being monitored based on their progress through the curriculum this year. So have we interviewed teachers to find out if what they see in children, if they're lacking the progress? The IST team has been supporting grade level teams and having conversations about what they're seeing, yes. Okay. And what do you estimate the caseload would be with the IST teachers? Um, I'm not sure that we know that entirely yet. So one thing that we need to do coming out of this year is identify kids at the end of the year for whom this year has been a significant struggle. And then we're gonna rely on the data to inform that. So when we get back in, students will start with the beginning of the year assessment in iReady, as well as in Go Math and in Wonders. And then we'll start tracking kind of that information compared to in-classroom performance. And they'll be ref referred to IST based on what we're seeing. Now the IST, is that gonna be a committee or is that just an IST IST teacher? is a committee. This is a teacher who will support that and be a case manager. Um, a few years ago, when um, I happened to have been principal of the high school, we put an, basically an IST support into the high school. Mm -hmm. um, one thing being that it adds another safety net for regular education students. And one thing that we've learned with our special education students this year is because they have case managers and people who help them with calendaring of assignments, work completion, getting extra help, encouraging them to interface with their teachers, they have been a little more successful than students who are struggling without that support. When it existed previously at the high school, we saw SPP score increases from 92 to 101. Mm -hmm. So we have this sort of, um, you know, tried and tested in terms of the position and what it's, how powerful it can be. We're looking to expand that to Pine Road, Murray, and the high school for next year. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. McGuinn, I have just one question. Is this built into the budget or is, is this coming out of any funds? It seems like we're already over the, the funds that we have. Yeah, this, this will not be coming out of budgeted funds. This will be right from the grant. Okay. So we'll be applying right for the grant, util, utilizing current okay. salaries. It like it was like and then we will backfill uh, those positions when the teachers are on special assignment mm -hmm. with hiring of long-term subs to replace those teachers for that temporary time frame. Because it looked like there's a one, one million four hundred ninety million. Then there's the one point five that we've already used. Is well, that the, remember, is that in in total, the district is receiving that large amount. This is the only staffing that we have been putting that we will plan to put against though that total allocation. Okay. The majority of the rest of use of that allocation is essentially reimbursing the district for items that uh, we had to purchase to make sure, as Mrs. Drennan indicated, that all students had access to one-to-one -one computing, all students ha and teachers had the, uh, the personal protective equipment that was needed so that we could open at the beginning of the school year in a hybrid situation, um, and then uh, subsequently in a full day, uh, five day in person. So is this the 20% that has to be used from that? I'm sorry? Is that the 20%? 20% yeah, well, this will, this will end up being more than 20% right. because we thought it was, it was powerful enough right. to address, as Mrs. Drennan indicated, the potential schooling loss. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we are exceeding the 20% of those ESSER funds, uh, but we feel 
uh, that we, as, as an administrative team, that that was an extremely important thing to do. Uh, and as, as you'll see, we do address some of the other two components of those top three priorities. Okay. Thank you. Why are the salaries so high? They're higher than the top salaries for our current staff. So we, con Dr. Cohen, we conservatively looked at, <clears throat> um, we took the salary scale of a teacher at um, year 14 with a master's plus 30 along with their benefits to calculate that. Um, we estimate this, that, that the teachers that would go on assignment may fit that mold of that. We wanted to make sure. We don't know yet exactly who those staff members will be, um, but we're required for the grant purposes not to place the person whom we're just add, you know, bringing in as a long-term sub because they're not the ones actually doing the work to what this grant is intended to do. So. I didn't know that it included benefits. It did, yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Trennan, I have a question. I'm going to speak to you with my back. I hope that's okay. <laughs> um, my neck's sore. Um, this is a one-year assignment, um, and, and you said you had some success with it in the past as the high school principal. Have you thought about um, if we are successful, um, extending it beyond the one-year grant funding? And you know, because because if it if it's successful, we don't want it to stop after one year. Uh, have you thought about that? So we've thought about it, but going back to the initial um, comments from Mr. McGuinn, this grant is uh, supposed to be utilized for one-term positions. If we were to um, continue any position that began during this grant, we would have to fund it locally and figure out how to make it fit into a budget that's already pretty tight. So um, I have been warned repeatedly, Mr. Geiger, to <laughs> stay in my lane and just do things for a year. But um, you know, being respectful of the budget, I would say we anticipate this being a one-year position. And, and Mr. Geiger, to, to dovetail off of that, Yes, I keep Mrs. Drennan in her lane. No, no, I'm just kidding. Um, we, like any position that comes up uh, historically in this district, we will evaluate it. Uh, and if we see the cost benefit being for the students and for the betterment of the educational uh, process in the district, uh, we will look to uh, potentially build that into a budget. Uh, so. Not only are we, you know, looking to have our eyes toward the 21-22 school year with this grant funding, we are certainly looking beyond that. And uh, if it is a successful program, it's something that we would, you know, take into account during the entire budget yeah. process. Perhaps even float the idea that, okay, there, there could be future grant funding, not at the same level, it's pretty high but maybe they can come back with something in subsequent years much lower, but that could pay for this. Uh, if you have a crystal ball, that'd be great. <laughs> but uh, once again, uh, we, are, we are viewing these as one-time funds. To Mr. McGuinn's credit, I would also add that as a business manager, he definitely is supportive of things that are student-focused and beneficial to students, and we're really lucky to have that as a perspective of our business manager. Quick, quick question. Um, the budget or that we put away to give to MCIU isn't part of that for services like ISD? Isn't that something they're supposed to be providing? I apologize. I really can't hear that. <clears throat> the budget that we put away each year for MCIU, for the services that we purchase through them that we're required to, aren't they supposed to be providing services such as these included in that? Typically, no. no. Those are real targeted services, mostly towards special education programs um, that, that, and services that are rendered with them. Anything outside of that, we still then pay a separate amount of monies toward that outside of what that, that budget is toward that. So the, the, the simple answer to that is no. Now, some of that inside of special ed services may get recouped in some, some particular way, but really not dedicated the way that we're intending this to be. Good thinking, though. The next allocation related to um, curriculum and instruction is some 
summer programming for students that will not have a cost associated with it for the families. So one of the things that we wanted to do was re-engage with our students in a supportive fashion and to provide some emotional and mental health engagement. Some, um, we've seen some decreased engagement with students. We know that students through the course of the year have shown signs of emotional and mental health distress. Some have shown academic struggles. There has been a lack of social opportunities and sort of this idea of not being schooled for the past year. We want to have opportunities that are low stress and supportive where students can come together either to explore something fun or to help close any gaps that exist at this point. So we're looking to create some summer opportunities to help students with the transition back to the school year. And we've identified some summer enrichment classes that range um, from art to reader's theater at the elementary level to kind of a experience to help them gear up for the next grade level. Uh, what previously was our Title I and Title III camp, we've renamed Pine Road Wind Camp. We will offer summer school, which Lower Moreland traditionally does not do, but for students at the high school level who are seeking to recover um, their credit for any high school courses that they are not successful in passing, we will offer that opportunity. The rates associated for teachers and assistants are listed there as well as the need for supplies. We estimate that this will cost about $22,000 under the grant. The next targeted area is that of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and Mrs. Galdo will speak on these priorities. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Drennan. Uh, so under the uh, category of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, we want to uh, increase the capacity of our professional staff to engage in thoughtful instruction and conversation related to topics of diversity and inclusion, um, and increase the opportunities for the involvement of all stakeholders. Um, in April, we had our first uh, meeting of the uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, Council, and uh, we, are, that we started on the uh, you know, multi-year journey uh, that is, is part of that. And as uh, we progress along that journey, we'll need to engage uh, experts in the, in the, in the field uh, to develop professional learning opportunities for our staff and members of the administration and for all, all our stakeholders. Um, so we have some of the cost uh, up there. Um, so Again, we're going to have to partner with some consultants to develop these learning opportunities and uh, um, hold what we're thinking focus groups and listening sessions uh, for our community. Um, we're uh, going to uh, continue our membership in the Delaware Valley Consortium for Excellence and Equity. Um, there's a cost associated with the Montgomery County Cultural Proficiency and Equity Student Ambassador Program uh, that several of our high school students are involved, a part of. Um, as, as I also said there, we're going to have a professional development on uh, cultural com competency and creative conversations. And uh, there's a fee associated with some of the diversity job fairs uh, that are, we participate in for hiring purposes. A quick question about that. Um, the DEI program that we've been talking about was a three to five year estimated right. process. Um, and where they're saying all these funds are a one-time only right. deal. So this would be just to kind of set things up and get them started, I'm assuming. And then after that, it would come out of our district budget then for the remainder of the that, process? That's correct, okay. yes. Um, we've talked to Mr. McGuinn about that, and that's something that's going to need in future years to come out of our general fund. So we will be budgeting appropriately then for the needs as we make our way through in years to come. But we wanted to dedicate for this first year and certainly under this grant opportunity, the ability to, to utilize some of this funding toward that directly. Yeah. Another goal that we have related to our district's diversity um, will focus on the engagement of English learners and non-English speaking households. We have 938 students in the district whose family uh, identified a different or a language other than English that's spoken in the home. When we reflect on this past year, it's easy to get caught up in all the things that were difficult and all the things that perhaps didn't go the way we had wanted. 
One area that I think we appreciate as a school district and as a staff and a school community is the level of support and engagement that our parents and our students' guardians have um, become involved in students' learning, interactions with teachers, support of teachers, um, interaction and in in feedback to our schools. And if we can do one thing right moving forward, it would be to do everything that we can to continue to engage families in a similar manner. One thing that research shows is that a supportive home uh, relationship with a school is definitely beneficial to the outcome, the learning outcomes and success of students. So one thing that we want to do is continue to increase the fluidity of communication and make information more readily accessible for students whose parents' first language is not English. And we discovered that there is a, an application out there called Talking Points, which allows for two-way multilingual communication. And it can occur through type messages as well as closed captioning on video messages that can be shared with families. Um, so this is a really interesting and exciting opportunity for teachers in the district because it's, the account is linked to a student, which means that all teachers can communicate with the families. Um, and how it works is via the internet, the teacher would type in an email. It would go out in English. The Talking Points app then knows what language the family will receive it in then the family receives it and they type their response in their home language and it comes back to the teacher again in English. Talking Points is a nonprofit organization. Um, I really respect the work that they're doing because I think, especially in the school setting, it really helps to create that cohesive community. Um, it also will allow us to do some of our surveys that we're now doing in Google Forms and it will send it out to families in their home language. So, um, we're really excited about this opportunity to increase family engagement and to bring it down to the classroom level and not just be district messages and communication. Well, will it be able to handle all of the languages that we have? We have a pretty broad uh, list of languages. Will it encompass all almost 40 languages? Talking Points supports 110 languages. All right. Perfect. So, so far, I have not found one that would not be supported, <laughs> but we'll see. For the professional development, will that be across all three schools and will it be required? For which professional development? For DEI? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It would be across all three schools and it would be a part of a professional learning day that all teachers are required to attend. Part of the, uh, the action plan that we anticipate putting together is going to involve that, most especially with Barbara Moore Williams and cultural proficiency. So it's a train to train a model to which we expect to bring administration and teacher leaders starting in September in for a year long training of cultural proficiency and, and, and our delivery systems and, and identifying that throughout the classrooms with then those teacher leaders taking back to their grade levels, taking back to their departments, and um, that train to trainer type of, uh, of thing across then three years of us delivering that. You know, rather than trying to host, you know, 200 large sessions with, with, with folks in an auditorium somehow, um, we, we believe this will be a model that will capture that and be able to be very, very inclusive with those. So we anticipate one year of training with the initial group and then two more years within our schools with the teachers themselves, and then expanding that into our student, student bases as well. So again, this will be a, we expect the DEI component to be instituted inside of what we do with a strategic plan as it, as it comes to teaching and learning forever. Um, so this is just our initial steps into that for a The next area of focus um, for the allocation of funds has to do with student services. So I'll turn now to Mr. Giordano. Thank you. We realize and recognize that as we return more students to the buildings, uh, those, a large number of those students will bring with them mental health needs that we do not have the capacity to support currently. Um, and we're already seeing, certainly seeing some of those needs um, this school year, um, such as just failure to, to engage either in person or virtually, 
difficulty re-socializing with peers or even with, with um, staff members, and just the various effects of, of trauma that the uh, pandemic as a whole has brought on, whether it be a loss of a loved one, friend, uh, family member, and whatnot. So to that end, um, we our plan would be to hire uh, mental health support counselors via a contract with an outside agency um, to uh, support students as, as we identify them most, most likely through the IST process. Um, we, we anticipate a two-year commitment, which would, should take us through the, the waning of the, of the pandemic. Um, we, would, we would look to hire two mental health support counselors, place one person at five days a week, full-time, uh, place one of those persons at Pine Road to assist the, the, with the mental health needs of students who are both in-person and virtual. We would place one of those counselors at Murray Avenue to assist uh, with students who are in-person uh, and virtual, as well as assist um, our high school um, students who are who have chosen to remain virtual. So we do feel like we have the capacity at the high school to to um, support the needs of our students who are in person in the building, uh, with the current counseling staff that we have in our in our building. Um, we are we are required to obtain three quotes um, for these services. We have done so. Um, the the figure listed there is the lowest of the three that we have obtained. And it is, however, from an agency that we've used before to provide um, supports in our, in our school buildings in, in the form of mental health support counselors. So we do have confidence in, the, in that, that, um, that provider. Will the support services be available starting through the summer or is it gonna be start of the year? Like this would be the start of the year. Is there any way that we could offer that beginning of summer? because you have a lot of students who are coming through the transition. You have a lot of their friends and peers that are gonna be going away to camp. They're gonna be going different ways. I think we're potentially are gonna see an emotional fallout by some students. And I'd rather the potential possibility of support be there in some shape or form. I think it's almost more important than the camp services, et cetera, as far as being able to support we the could consider the that the the only issue with that would be the provider having persons available by that time. So we do have a, we do um, we need to notify uh, a provider by the end of May so that they can obtain staff. Um, these such counselors are not in plentiful supply right now because of the you know the, the, everybody's asking for the same the same thing basically. So it's something to consider whether or not we could actually do it remains to be seen. I'd ask that we consider it, go from sure. there. That was similar to a question I had. Um, if our extended school year surface services might be enhanced or prolonged a little this summer, um, realizing that the kids who participate in extended school year may need a little extra beefing up before September um, because of the effects of COVID and everything that was going on. Well, extended school year is its own, um, its own entity um, that is provided based upon regression or, and failure to recoup skills lost after an extended break in school. So that is, that could be winter break, that could be summer break, it could be us um, as an IP team predicting that a student will um, lose skills as, as they historically have done. So that's its own, its own entity. So if a student does not show the need, um, then they would not be eligible for extended school year, so they would not be in that program. Uh, we, do, we do plan on offering our COVID compensatory services this summer, which is separate from extended school year. We, we hope to provide that in some way, way, shape, and form during the time period that we are um, providing extended school year, separate and apart from extended school year, but maybe, maybe happening at the same, the same time frame from July um, 6th to August 5th. Um, and if those needs are identified within that, if we're able to um, provide services in the summer, we could possibly consider that, but, it, but again, it's, it's, it's the COVID compensatory services are its own entity as well. So we have to be sure that we're providing services based upon um, learning loss for students with IPs. Okay, so the same student may then participate in both extended school year and the other summer programs going on? Possibly, related. yes, yes. Okay, thanks. A little, little bit dependent upon schedules yes. and how those are are going to operate and we're highly dependent upon staff as well exactly. so some of that is working around scheduling with staff um, to be able to uh, to offer those so yeah. uh, I have one question am, am I correct that as a two-year commitment that half of this expenditure would be a budget item 
both years are allocated to the grant. Okay. So Thank some you. of so the grant itself. Um, Ooh, that was not <laughs> shocking. <laughs> the um, grant itself spans a number of years, and so we had the option of one year allocations, two year allocations, or even three. Correct, Mr. McGuire. The the, ac the actual grant periods for all ESSER one, two, and three have a start date that goes back all the way to March of 2020. ESSER two uh, goes till. Uh, September of 2023. ESSER 3 actually goes to September of 2024. Uh, so they're multi-year grants. Again, we're, we're, we see uh, the need for most of our expenditures, as you can see laid out, in the, in the first year to try to catch up, for lack of a better term. And this service is just one last one last bit um, on this. This would be for students with and without IP. So this is for general education and special education. This is for all students. Mr. Giordano, quick question. Um, I noticed on tonight's agenda, uh, next in personnel, there's uh, more school psychologists, behavioral specialists than I'm used to seeing. Uh, is that part of the two counselors one at Mary, one at Pine Road. Is this? No, they are. They not, are. No, they're not. This would be in addition to the ones on tonight's agenda. Yeah, these are annual re-up, what we call right. annual okay. re-ups of their contracts. Okay. So it's it's not inclusive of, of okay. them. They are what we've had for years. Okay. And yeah. This okay. is just the traditional re-up period okay. of time for those those annual contracts. Just a question on, you know, one at Mary, one at Pine Road. Um, if. Uh, some more support services are needed for students at the high school. Would we allocate some counselor's time to high school students as well? Oh, this, this could be flexible, yes. This is, this is a general parameters in which we, we would like to work. Um, we are we're dealing with a little bit of an unknown. We do expect you know, to, uh, an exponential increase in what we're seeing now as far as mental health needs of students, you know, kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop, so to speak. Um, so if, if the need doesn't present itself as, as as extremely as we think it would be a pine, for instance, we may shift that person's supports to, to the okay. high school or, or any other school, you know, Murray Avenue as well. We also believe we have the internal capacity to support students um, through our community counselor at the high school already. So this would be, you know, Pine Road doesn't currently have a community counselor and Murray Avenue has a part-time community counselor. So that's the other aspect here. <laughs> All right, the next area of focus um, for grant funds is related to technology. I think all of us appreciate technology differently right now than we did perhaps two years ago at this time. Um, Lower Moreland's ability to turn technology around and get it in the hands of students and Dr. Hilt's foresight in being able to put orders in for things in a timely fashion left us not waiting for you know items. There were some districts that were waiting months to get things in the hands of students and we were really fortunate in all of this. We also learned some lessons about our families and their needs. So Dr. Hilt's going to speak a little bit about grant funds allocated to technology. Thank you, Mrs. Drennan. Good evening, everyone. As the uh, stakeholders met and discussed some of the challenges related to technology, as Mrs. Drennan uh, spoke to, we are very fortunate that with our replacement and refresh cycle, we have uh, some new and some not quite new but reliable devices. Uh, this is uh, this summer uh, in relation to our refresh cycle, we will replace our oldest devices in all three buildings. So our oldest devices will go from five years to two years. And as I present uh, each month the repair numbers, most of the repairs are at Murray Avenue and that is uh, due to the age of the devices and not necessarily the, the care that the students have been taking. So all of those devices will be replaced this summer. And so that led the conversation to ensuring the continuity of learning uh, with enrichment, remediation, and access at home. And uh, what we found in the past year is families have uh, needed internet access. So it, whether it's inside or outside of a pandemic, we know that learning continues after the, the school hours. So we want to make sure that uh, students have access to high-speed internet at home, and our recommendation is to provide options for families who are in need. Now, these options include uh, hotspots, and the, the term device-based LTE would mean that 
basically the, the internet connectivity would be built into a Chromebook and uh, would provide the student with access to academic materials. Now, uh, over the past year, we have, uh, we, we were again fortunate to have access to hotspots last March that we were able to provide to families knowing that, that this was an important time uh, for connectivity. And we did loan three hotspots over the past year uh, on a temporary basis. And there are programs, and uh, some of you may be familiar with Comcast Essentials, T-Mobile and Verizon also have programs. So this would be a bridge, and this would allow families to, uh, if they need assistance, we would help, but this would provide access at home. It would involve a survey to identify the, those families in need, and we're allocating uh, or estimating $360 per year per household. And we say per household because these devices can support multiple, these hotspots can support multiple devices. And uh, we've, we've put a number on it as up to 10,000 with approximately 10 students per building needing access. So that was where that number came from. And again, we, we certainly support families and help them with uh, acquiring a long-term solution, but this is of utmost importance especially with uh, the significance of technology. Dr. Height, I have a question. Dr. Height, I have a question. Um, concerning, do, are we looking into the um, devices that the teachers use? I know using them ex as extensively as they do all day. Um, I myself have a surface and I know when I'm done, it's really, really hot because I was told they were not meant to be used quite that long of, over Zoom. Um, are we taking into account any kind of effect that that's going to have on the staff uses and any kind of um, replacement that we might have to use for that? Absolutely, and, uh, and your, your question is perfect timing. Just this week, we sent out a survey to staff. We are replacing staff devices this summer, and we've worked with our, our standard vendors, which is Dell and Lenovo, to ensure that we would have a, a future-ready device that has a long battery life and is capable of multitasking, which is the, really the most important feature at this mm -hmm. point, that they're able to host a Google Meet, they're able to use their smart notebook, they're able to use their curriculum-based software at the same time. So uh, perfect timing for this question. And the, uh, the, the purchase will go to the board either at the next meeting or the, or the first meeting in June. And uh, those devices that teachers are using now will be salvaged. So we'll get a return on investment, which also will go to the board. So uh, we're, we're thinking the same thing that you are, and we want to make sure that the teachers have the devices that will, will take them into the future. Okay. Thank you. The last area of priority relates to facilities and our capacity to implement our health and safety plan. And Mr. McGuinn took the leadership role on this area. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Drennan. Um, again, our, our uh, area is obviously cost control. Um, this is kind of be, this will be the catch-all to, to, to round out the grant that it all really hasn't already been spent. Uh, again, we're, we're trying to account for non-recurring expenditures and identify reimbursement opportunities. And as you can see on the next slide, uh, you know, we have spent and all these items here are looked to be reimbursement of expenditures that have already occurred for the most part. So we've increased our nursing services. Our regular nurses actually spend a good amount of their day being contact tracers. Uh, so we had to bring in nursing services to supplement them for the school day as well as bringing in nurses uh, to help us with the on-site testing of staff um, that, ha that occurs um, uh, each week. Uh, we had uh, a, a, a vacancy uh, at our secondary level where because of COVID, we just could not find uh, a teacher. So we had some teachers step up, teach them uh, additional periods, we'll look to reimburse the district for the costs that we've already incurred for that. Uh, we've cleaned and disinfected our buses each and every day. Uh, we'll look to reimburse for that. And again, um, we, we applied for some of our uh, costs of daytime porters. Uh, in fact, through January of 2021, we're uh, reimbursed through another grant. Uh, we'll look to reimburse uh, for the remainder of the school year. Important thing to, to note, um, 
as we move forward. And Dr. David Heiser spoke of this uh, a bit uh, as he talked about the County Health Department, Governor Wolf's announcements. We're still evaluating how next school year will look. Um, do we have a need for all the PPE that was needed this year? Do we have a need to have daytime porters to clean and disinfect high touch areas? Once again, we're going to take the, the recommendations from the health professionals that govern our school districts to try to do this. So um, as you'll see um, in the breakout between the two grants, this pot of money is kind of making up what was not spent for items uh, that uh, my colleagues have talked about. So again, there's how the ESSER II and the ESSER III grant uh, have, um, uh, ha how we plan to allocate the funds. There are some advertising and posting requirements for, for the ESSER III grant, uh, and we'll post the information for the ESSER II grant as well. The ESSER II grant is actually available now. Uh, we are waiting for our board to review all this before we start to write the grant. The ESSER III grant has not been released as of yet. I, I believe they're targeting uh, mid to late May for the release of that. Um, so I will turn it over back to Mrs. Dren. So the next steps related to both ESSER II and ESSER III, um, from just remind you from the beginning of the presentation, ESSER III needs to go through a public review period of 30 days. This presentation will be posted on our website for that duration. We will seek your board, uh, the board approval in June at the public board meeting. And then once things are approved, we'll begin implementing some of the um, aspects of our plan. Summer programming will you know, go live and we'll begin to hire personnel. So we'll seek our TOSAs for instructional support and we'll also um, have our agreement substantiated with the outside um, provider for mental health counselors. Dr. David Heiser, back to you. Now I wanna thank our cabinet for that presentation and all their efforts related to their areas. Um, this was a fully inclusive team project and as you can see the timing of this is 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 purposeful ESSER two, which doesn't need to go through review but yet we've not even applied yet for the grant we wanted to include that just to show the magnitude most especially of the financial commitment to this and the impact that we expect um, and you can see most of those monies three quarters two-thirds of that really spent toward what we expect, whether it's schooling loss, learning loss, and a direct impact as it comes to intervention specialists and or counseling supports that we believe will, our students will need in the year to come or years to come. And some of the good questions you had, uh, you know, moving forward, we'll have to evaluate. Um, you know, they're, they're certainly when you put more personnel into play, one of the risks is it's difficult to pull back. So we need to evaluate that, but we were very purposeful how we did this so that we could do that if needed. Um, you know, putting a teacher on assignment and only committing to it for a certain period of time or using outside service agencies to supplement for our counseling. You know, we can do that and we have the flexibility. And so that was very, very pur purposeful in our intent. Um, the timing for this, again, as, as, as the cabinet uh, shared, is a 30-day review period. So our plan with your provision this evening is to post this presentation on our website along with the recording portion of this so that um, folks in the community and the public can look at it, listen to it, hear it again, and um, certainly come with any questions that they do have with regards to this. And at our regular meeting in June, we, we, that would allow us enough time to bring this plan in front of you for a motion of recommendation for approval and then allow us, as you see, with a couple of those hires to really move quickly into prior to the, um, prior to July, um, hopefully um, ascertaining those, those, those folks um, or sometime at least over the summer so that we, um, we can plan appropriately and have the necessary resources in place for, for what we intend to do from the start of the school year. All right. And you're probably hearing a lot of information about this. This is a significant amount of money, as I, as I mentioned, um, you know, throughout a, a neighboring school district in, in, in Philadelphia, a lot of publicity more recently. 
um, one point, I believe it was 1.1, not million, but billion dollars um, in ESSER three funding for it. Um, so you can see the magnitude of monies that are, are being spent and certainly um, the amount of public interest that we have in this and we want to make sure that we're doing everything um, in our part to make sure our public is aware of, of our intentions with this. Dr. Okay. David, I have one quick question before we move on. Is uh, I know I, I'm impressed. I think our team did a great job. Um, is there any talk, collaboration with other districts about what they're doing? Because we don't know what we don't know. Maybe there's another good idea out there that we haven't discovered. And is yeah. there any? That's just wondering. Good, if good question. Uh, the talking points actually did come from a discussion that Mrs. Drennan um, had that program with a neighboring school district that. Um, has just started utilizing it and, and we got a, a little bit of a, a test run into how it works and saw the magnitude and, and how it could be applied here for us in pretty successful ways. So as superintendents, we certainly this is, this is beyond COVID numbers. This is certainly point number two right now and inside of all their same job alike uh, groups, Mrs. Drennan's curriculum and instruction across the county, this is, this is point number one since the monies have been um, released and um, uh, the discussions happening. Supported by the MCIU, they're a resource center for us, so they've collated a number of resources to be able to look at and determine uh, the needs through that. And as Mrs. Drennan mentioned, there's a PDE resource site for us to look into and, 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 and note some of those types of things in different areas to which we could apply um, um, and, and see if there's things there that we, we, we would want to ascertain um, when it comes to, to that. But we. We do believe we've landed on some areas that we think directly based on anecdotal, some real hard objective data that we've had through, through um, our, our, our ready and through our teachers um, and some anecdotal things that we're hearing and seeing from students that we think really um, are going to need some explicit resources toward them. Okay. So our next presentation, and I'm going to keep Mrs. Drennan on the docket here. Um, we're going to talk a little German tonight, as our former German teacher in the school district, Mrs. Drennan. Um, talk a little bit about the German program itself, uh, as we learned some information more recently about a retirement um, in that department, and want to bring to your attention a plan of action that we have. So, Mrs. Drennan. So in light of Frau Stiles' announcement of her retirement, Dr. David Heiser asked me to, from the lens of a curriculum instruction person, not from the lens of a former German teacher, look um, kind of in a very hard way at um, our numbers and at the feasibility of finding a replacement for Frau Stiles and then ultimately making a recommendation about the future of the program. So um, I have done that. So just some program highlights. Um, the German program provides German club opportunities at both Murray Avenue and the high school. And through the years, it has also been a part of Pine Road Enrichment. We've enjoyed a long-standing gap exchange program, originally in Nuremberg and um, more recently in Ulm. And we've had students who have been afforded the opportunity to uh, earn a scholarship through the American Association of Teachers in German and actually go through their summer study program. We also have had great success at language competitions, especially at the Montgomery County level. And um, on Lower Moreland High School scholarship evening, there are actually two German awards that are given, one from the district and one from an outside entity. So German has served a large number of kids well for a good number of years. And um, if we look at historical enrollment from 2011 until now, you will see that the, the numbers for enrollment are not um, huge, right? So we're a small school district. We offer three choices of language. Statistically, there will be a, th a third language with smaller enrollment than the other two programs, regardless of what that language is. So. Um, for us, historically, German has been the smallest of the three, and we had sort of a nice boost in 2018, but typically our total enrollment from grades 7 through 12 tends to linger somewhere in the 40, uh, the number of 40. 
And the anticipated enrollment for next year um, at this juncture looks to be fairly low. So we have not yet enrolled um, or had students entering seventh grade make a language decision. Based only on enrollment for grades eight through 12 for next year, there are 24 students who are seeking to continue to study German in Lower Moreland. So if we were to hit you know, a large class size, we would be back into the 40s if seventh grade were a large group. But right now, based on the enroll, the requ course requ request numbers, we are only at 24 students. So that leads us to um, the next question about should we continue to offer German and staff a full-time employee for what could be only 24 students. And every time we do world language curriculum renewal, the question of continuing German has come up. It came up when I was the teacher, it's come up since Ralph Stiles has been the teacher. And based on its size, it, it always comes into question. Typically, through the surveys that are done, the community is supportive of maintaining German. The kids want to continue to see German. But now we're at a kind of programmatic turning point because we have a teacher who's retiring and the question of sustaining a full-time employee for a small number of students is a different conversation than it has been previously. Through some research as to whether or not it would be uh, feasible to staff the program again, Mrs. Gaudo discovered that there are only 14 um, teachers with German certification in the REAP program. It doesn't mean there are only 14 available teachers anywhere, um, but right now those are the ones who have their resumes uploaded into REAP, and we don't know if they're already in a teaching position or not. So we went to have further discussion with Dr. David Heiser, and I think um, the recommendation this evening is that we continue to maintain the programming in a different way for students who are interested to finish their career studying German, but not to begin with another level of German one students heading into the next academic year. So for students who were anticipating taking, Germ taking German next year and in the years beyond, uh, we will provide some program maintenance. And what that will mean is we are able to secure, to secure online opportunities for levels two through five through MVP, which is Montgomery County virtual program and we've had a relationship with them before in the past um, so we'll enroll any students who wish to take German in that program and the one sticking point is it's very difficult to find AP German in an online format so we're still looking I've begun conversation with local districts to see if our students could take German through their programming um, we have two schools who are right now um, investigating whether that would be a possibility I'm also in communication with local colleges to see if it could be a dual enrollment opportunity. And the last thing that we could do really would be sort of an independent study related to AP German. So students who want AP German would have the opportunity to do that. We just don't have it defined yet what that will look like. The other thing that we can do is offer the option um, beginning for next school year for any student who was anticipating taking German and now has decided that perhaps going a different course would be better for them. Maybe an online option is not something they desire. So we uh, will be able to offer French one and Spanish one to students both at Murray Avenue and the high school for next year. So if anybody wishes to change um, their language going forward, that's something that we can absolutely sustain. So next steps. Um, next year actually is year one of curriculum renewal for world language. And so we will go through the needs assessment. The big question becomes, do we replace German and have three languages moving forward? Or do we recognize based on our size that having three languages may be more than we can sustain? And that too allows our students to have more balance in terms of programming so we will go through the needs assessment and investigate those questions the way we typically do in a year one. For the next school year, however, we will reassign that FTE, the full-time employee, to a different area temporarily, knowing that if we were to determine that it's appropriate for us to have a third language available, that we would recapture that position and support that language. And 
Back to Dr. David Heiser. So any questions from the board with regards to this recommendation from administration? It's never easy when you say, uh, and certainly with a longstanding program, um, to say that might, you know, we're, we're closing that program, certainly phasing that program out over time. Um, that's never an easy thing. Um, we think it's the right time based on the fact that we have a retirement in there. Our numbers right now are, are fairly low. Um, it might be an opportunity for, um, for us to reallocate that FTE for a year um, and utilize it in a, in a very significant way um, while the committee next year takes a look at what, what, what sorts of things do we want to do um, as it relates to any other language programs or like Mrs. Drennan said, are we um, maybe of the size where only two languages really should be supported moving forward here inside the district? So glad to take any questions. Why do you think there was such a big drop off this year? It looked like it was holding pretty steady for a long time. Why do you think the big drop off in German? Well, again, it does not include, we, we didn't register seventh graders yet. So, you know, I would expect those numbers, they could go up into the 30s possibly with, 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 with registrants. But before we did that registration with our seventh graders, we wanted to, to, to present this to you first um, and not go through that registration and then present something like this to you. And then after. we had just one full-time employee teaching all the levels of German? in all the in both schools that's what we currently have now right that's what we yes currently have. okay um i can't wait I, i've been waiting to do this Ms. mrs drennan ich bin ein berliner mr drennan i was a german student here at lower <laughs> moreland and uh frau bumbaka and herr hausman would be very proud of me at this point um what year do we start world languages it's, it's in murray avenue what grade Seventh Starting grade. that in the seventh grade level. I mean, could an option be to keep the two languages but then start earlier? Because I've always heard that, you know, brain development students can pick yeah. up languages earlier. So let's. Do you, Mrs. Drennan, do you want to talk a little bit about that with exploratory and any other experiences? Sure. Um, that question, Mr. Geiger, comes up each time we renew world language and um, the question of FLES, which is the elementary language program, does often get raised. Um, what we have done, I think, you know, in honor of the budget in particularly, but also in regards to staffing and scheduling, what we've chosen to do is provide enrichment courses at Pine Road um, after school enrichment in language, if that's something that a family desires. But um, based on our staffing resources, we have not brought, you know, we've chosen to not bring FLES down to the elementary level. And then in sixth grade, there have been times throughout history, like historically, that we have offered exploratory language. But again, the staffing becomes a real challenge. So um, you have teachers who already teach six sections and then, you know, adding sixth grade then creates a need for more staffing. And, just kind of navigating that. We do put students, we do allow students in sixth grade to have an exploratory cultural experience prior to selecting, but we did do away with sort of that rotation through the three languages before making a decision that used to be here historically, yeah. Just a comment, um, not really a question, but um, just my opinion that I would strongly encourage adding a third language, even if that's not German. Um, I don't know, and I don't know the availability of staff, but um, you know, Mandarin and Russian come to mind. Um, just because we do have a goal of educating global citizens, and um, knowing that in the workplace so many corporations are multinational corporations um, where you are, are exposed to coworkers from other countries, and you know, even if people don't become fluent in these other languages, I think the appreciation of other cultures is a very important thing um, that would be lost if you're only offering Spanish and French. So, again, just my opinion, but I think that's important. Yeah, I'm, I, I would imagine the committee um, next year will take in that into some serious consideration. I think the challenge 
that we, we probably always face will be from the staffing lens of that and the amount of certifications that exist in, in Pennsylvania related to as a, as a Russian certification or even as a uh, Mandarin Chinese um, certification. They're, 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 they're far and few between, um, but it's something that I'm sure the committee is going to look at. Is there a way to have uh, enrichment course, courses starting in earlier grades where uh, parents can sign their kids up for enrichment in other languages to start earlier, even French, Spanish, or any other language? Yes, historically, um, the enrichment program that runs at Pine Road after school has had um, the inc it has included French, Spanish, and German. So it's not always consistent because it's based on our ability to find staff to do it, but historically all three have been offered as a part of the enrichment program from time to time. Mrs. Drennan, I have a question. Um, if you were to take a language and, and teach it in the younger grades, I know the, the problem is where do you find it within the day? So what do some schools do? Like how are they able to do that? Are they more of a private school where they don't have a, such a structured day as in a public school? So my understanding of, uh, so New Jersey, and New Jersey a lot of schools offer FLESS, um, and locally there are few who do. Um, typically it's not a program that meets every day, um, and it might not even meet on every cycle, but it's sort of this inconsistent smattering of exposure to language. Some districts, like in New Jersey, have a more formalized program. The one thing I will say about it universally is that um, students have awareness of some words, mm -hmm. but you know, as far as an experience goes, the fluency is not achieved through elementary exposure to language, typically. Mm -hmm. If you have a bilingual situation, that's different. If you have a school who's really committed to it or um, has a population that drives the decision to really invest in that, it's different, but typically it's more of an exploratory experience, and so the outcome isn't you know, fluent students entering middle school kind of a thing, typically. Mm -hmm. um, so it's more often that it's in a rotation for Encore, a day, either every six days or 12 days, um, and that's usually how people work that in. I mean, I've seen, I, I think I've seen one school where they, they chose only one language, and then everything is labeled, like doors are labeled, windows are labeled, yes. so that you know, they understand vocabulary. And I think probably the, the strength of that is that they, they get the pronunciation down. So they're, even though they don't know the, the conjugation and all that, they're able to do that. Maybe it sparks an interest in them. Mm -hmm. But it seems like it would be great to introduce it, maybe not in kindergarten, but maybe in like third or fourth, and then they move out of Pine Road and then they take something with them. Yeah, most often um, the language chosen is Spanish. There mm -hmm. are some examples though where it is French or German. It's based on the community and what they desire. Um, so the committee next year for curriculum renewal, I'm sure will take this um, into consideration mm -hmm. again moving forward. Thank you. Okay, no other questions. Um, we're gonna keep Mrs. Drennan going here. How's the arm? You good? Yeah, I think I need a yoga session yeah. or something right now. <laughs> All right, one more. So we've asked Mrs. Drennan just to, to, to talk and we're, uh, a little bit about next year academic year planning uh, when it comes to instructional planning and we'll all a little bit incorporate some of our thoughts uh, into this. But Mrs. Drennan, do you want to just kick that off for us, please? Sure. And again, board, you have this in your, in your folder. So regarding 2021 to 2022, I think probably in a lot of ways the unknowns are outweighing the knowns at this point, especially, for example, the announcement that was made today about changes to, um, you know, orders from the governor. So a lot of what we are talking about is proactive. You've seen the administration's capacity to pivot and change plans based on current information. So everything that we're talking about is really focused on restoring a sense of normalcy uh, to the best of our ability. And so while we don't know a lot of things, we know that that's desirable. So what's ahead next year? There's a lot that we'll learn in the course of the next few months. 
Um, however, our goal is to get back to a learning environment that feels more quote unquote normal. Um, I do air quotes on normal because we have also in this time learned a lot about what we can do better and we've learned a lot about our students and our families and so the structure of the school year next year um, will look more normal. Hopefully we'll be able to enhance our practices and not give up some of the things that we've learned this year that have been beneficial. But ultimately we will seek to be in a full five day instructional model, five days in person, the health and safety plan will need to be updated closer to the start of school using the information that is prevalent and um, related to us at the time. It will probably have an impact on the amount of spacing in classrooms. That's one thing that we do anticipate. But the goal for next year is to have no teachers on a dual platform. We will seek a single platform of in-person instruction for students who return to our buildings and we will attempt to create the most normal um, learning environment that we possibly can. Now we acknowledge that there will be some families who will seek a virtual learning option. Um, we are committed to attempting to um, fill those positions for a virtual setting at the elementary level with our own staff. So based on the number of families that seek an, a virtual learning option, we'll peel off teachers. They may have multi-grade level responsibilities. We'll do the best we can based on numbers, but we will attempt to use our own staff for that. At the secondary level, however, due to the intricacies of scheduling, due to the availability of staff, um, the different choices that students make when selecting their courses, we are recommending that we go with a third party vendor. And with that comes a more asynchronous environment than what the dual platform allowed for this year. The students who select the virtual learning option will need to be fairly independent because it is an asynchronous um, you know, situation and setup. And it won't be the Lower Moreland curriculum, but it will be as close to the Lower Moreland curriculum as possible. So when you contract with a third party vendor, you are able to look at units and topics of study. Everything's aligned to the PA standards, um, but it won't necessarily be the lower Moreland curriculum. So students who are in the virtual learning option may be at a little different place um, than students who are actually in the classroom with us five days a week. Um, all those credits will be transferable. They will come in and be on the transcript like Lower Moreland credits. None of that will be impacted, but it won't be Lower Moreland teachers facilitating the secondary virtual academy. It seems like that possibly could create a problem in that for secondary and even high school where more kids would pull out a lower moral and go to a virtual school instead, where we would then lose any funding for that student? Well, I don't know that they would have to seek a different opportunity because we are providing that virtual experience by way of us contracting with a, another party. So in the year, I believe that that was probably more apt to happen in years that we didn't provide a virtual option and a family wanted that. Um, but as far as, you know, kind of the experience goes, we'll seek a provider that will give them a really good opportunity and access to good programming. Um, so they wouldn't necessarily have to go seek a cyber school um, because we'll provide our own option for that. Well, Mrs. Drennan, will the, I mean, we have students going to college and you know, the colleges rec recognize Lower Moreland. Uh, education, this is going to be a, a third party vendor with a curriculum that mirrors ours but isn't ours. Uh, so are these students going to be not in our, the, the, des, the decile ranking that we have or because they're taking a different curriculum? So the curriculum is aligned to PA standards just the way ours does. The pacing may be different. Um, we do have the capacity to look at the units of study and help them to be aligned with us as best as possible. But if a student chooses virtual or they choose us, their transcript will still have like chemistry in, you know, 
11th grade and the grade will come in as is, then they will receive Lower Moreland credit for that. So I don't think there'll be a disparity from a college standpoint, no. Okay. Okay. There are a number of, um, I would just wanted to say, there are a number of school districts in Montgomery County who actually went this route this year. So they didn't wait until next year. We opted for dual platform. Um, it was a challenging experience, I think, both for our kids and our educators. And the practicality of recreating that next year is just um, not ideal. Ms. Strand, how are we going to, um, I guess, monitor these students? Because I think that was the issue this year, that children weren't being monitored. They were turned screens off. How we, it seems that we're spending a lot of money in counseling because of the isolation that children experience, but then we're going to allow them an opportunity for that. So I would think it would have to come with a, you know, a great amount of parental oversight with that as well. But how are we going to monitor that they are finishing projects and they are keeping up with everything? Each of the programs that we've looked into provides progress reports on a weekly basis. Um, one of the kind of roles of the mental health counselors that we're bringing in will also be to help to monitor the virtual students. So we've already talked about the need to provide some counseling support for students who opt to be online. Um, and also the weekly progress reports coming in will allow us to understand their progress, make connections with students who aren't progressing and aren't engaging. And do we have any kind of estimate how many children would be opting for this version? No, I don't know that we do. Um, I mean, clearly we have our numbers now with vaccinations increasing. There may be some families who are comfortable coming back to us. Our hope is to have our kids back mm -hmm. and have them with us and, you know, have that Lower Moreland experience that we all value. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we are in the, the era of school choice, so those, those students already have an opportunity if they wanted to, even outside a pandemic, to go to a cyber charter to which we would have to fund in that manner. So we're looking at this as this is a great opportunity, we believe, to get our students back into the building. But there's still, we imagine and project that there will still be some, I don't know how many yet, that will have to be something that we survey after the school year to know. Um, to be able to provide some sort of um, virtual learning platform for them. The, the sustainability of a dual platform system that we went through this year is not sustainable. Um, you know, we did the best, our teachers did a wonderful job, but it's just not sustainable. Even with a great many of students back in the classroom, inv invariably if you have a few students that are still all virtual, there's still a delivery system issue of how do you deliver to both in two different locations and invariably um, you're probably having computers up and mostly virtually delivering to uh, an audience that, that may not be in there because that's the only way to connect with them. So it's a difficult, it, it's difficult to balance that and we learned that this year and it's just a really phenomenal job what our teachers did at, to, to sustain it through, through the balance uh, of where we are now. We know we can't do that moving forward. Um, and we know we're gonna have a handful of, of families that may just be resistant to come back and offering them this opportunity may, um, uh, may afford them the opportunity to, to continue and align with where we are with that. Mrs. Drennan, do you wanna just talk about the length of period of time to which we would expect a student on this that would, between elementary and, and secondary? Sure. Um, so pragmatically, so one thing that we offered this year was a number of opportunities for people to make a different selection based on student need and different things. And I think moving forward, pragmatically, you know, every time we had a shift this year, it really was very impactful and it was difficult to sustain. So going into next year, um, after the busing slide, I'll go into kind of the next steps and the progression for us as a district, but we will ask people to make a year commitment. Um, you know, I think once schedules are set, especially at the secondary level, any shift to that could be um, actually harder probably to navigate than you might even imagine. So we would be asking for a year long commitment. Um, the next area um, we wanted- I'm sorry. I had a couple questions. Um, so this year, for the students who opted to be virtual, 
Were they still able to come to school to participate in person for extracurriculars and the music program? And yes, whatever? they were. They were. Okay, Correct. so that, would that continue if they're... That, that would, uh, under other the other guise of, of, of law, and, and with homebound students, that, that is the same way. And in fact, any charter school student that, in district that, to which their charter may not provide that same sort of opportunity, that's afforded to them as well. So yes, that would be something that's afforded to anybody that would choose, if the board so chooses to move in this direction, um, have the opportunity to come back and participate in band and choir and theater and okay. athletics and, and so forth. Okay, and then my other question is if they're, if the high school students are doing virtual through this third party, um, would they still be included in our statewide testing? Uh, yes, we, yes, we would actually have to bring them back into the building, uh, as it is now, at least this year, uh, all of our virtual students, and it's happening right now at Murray Avenue, um, have to come back into the building. So yes, we would have to. That might be interesting to see. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, the alignment to, to their courses is, is intentional. It's aligned to the standards. The scope and sequence may be a little bit out of ba different out of balance to what we are and how we are. Um, however, the, um, the intention of theirs is to have what they need by that test time um, and, and most of what they're being tested on. Um, but yes, we would be responsible to still test and those I students. I think it's important to note that virtual students are still our students. They're still Lower Moreland students. They're just being taught by a third party. Similarly, the way we contract out for school psychologists or for um, you know counselors or something like that, we're hiring a different entity to then actually go through and, and teach those students. But those students are still all ours and part of our program and still a very, very valued part of our community. There, uh, one piece to this that uh, I'll just add, and there's one caveat to this that, um, again, we don't know what the, the health guidance is going to be, and health and safety guidance moving into ne next school year is yet. So one thing that's impacting us right now is that close contact rule. It's, it's when a positive arrives and the close contact to that. So we don't know that aspect to what's going to happen, but I would imagine we're still going to see positive COVID cases arrive in our buildings next year, right? It's similar to the way the flu will be and, and has been. Um, so with that, we will still need to maintain a camera in each of our rooms like we do now in the event a positive arrives. And I would imagine that positive would probably, if it's identified, would have to quarantine. If the, if the health department does require that. So that would be the one time to which a teacher then would have to flip that camera on in order for us to be able to educate that child um, during that quarantine period. Uh, we don't know about close contacts, if that, you know, there is some talk of test to stay programs or if close contact tracing is even gonna continue or not, we don't know. But we will need to maintain some flexibility with that in our rooms, but we don't anticipate that to be on a real large scale, certainly with dwindling numbers, more vaccines, you know, um, lessening rates. We, you know, we hope that that doesn't rise. But this virus, uh, there's seasonality to the virus. Um, you know, there's already talk of late fall and winter and, and, and resurgence and things of that nature. So we just don't know. We need a little bit of flexibility to be able to manage that. So, and we will continue that. And fortunately, we have that capability already. We, we've done it this year and, and it's worked to the best of our ability. Sorry, Mrs. Dren. That's okay. The next area we wanted to address was busing. Um, one thing I will say is we anticipate increased ridership, so people should just be aware that we anticipate at least two, you know, it's going back to two to a seat and having buses be more crowded and full than they currently are. So next steps. Families will receive a survey in June. Um, and that survey will say that that people are making a binding decision. And we've said that all along and, and there have always, in each case, there have been a few cases where people ask for different consideration. I think it's important that anybody who is hearing this presentation begins to think about what is the best scenario for your family and begins to think about that now. Because when we hit June in planning for next year, 
because we're using a third party at the secondary level, we're going to need to craft contracts. We're going to have to um, make scheduling decisions. And when it comes to K through six, we're then going to have to decide what teachers of ours will become the virtual teachers. And so all of this is integral work and it's work that will take some time to do and do well. So when the family surveys go out in late June, um, we really are asking for a full year commitment to your choice of learning location. Um, knowing that you're either virtual or back with us. As I said before, we really are hoping that most students are able and willing to come back to us. I think we do our best work with our kids and our community when it's all together. However, for families who desire a different option, we will have one available to them and we will support them. Those students are still our students. They're still Lower Moreland students. And then in August, we will come back to you with an improved or changed um, a health and safety plan. We'll come back to you and explain how things are going to work and we'll also be able to update you on the schedule and how um, the virtual versus in-person panned out and things like that. This is Trenton. One question. Would we plan any before the decision has to be made in July? Um, would we plan any open houses at the schools for the students who have been virtual? and don't participate in any extracurricular activities, so they're not in the building at all? Would we, just to entice them, hey, it's safe, come on back, we want you back? Yeah, it's a good idea. We could look at, at doing that, yeah. Um, I, I don't know that we would do, I, I think we would wait until the end of the school year. Yeah. And, you know, we could do some, we could do some scheduled tours through, through a week, week or so after, yeah. after school is out and allow them opportunity. I know we did some of that um, um, again when we came back five day and some of the students that had been virtual for nearly three quarters of the year right. and gave them an opportunity to just walk through and, and, and so forth. So um, yes, we could certainly okay. do that. Any other questions from the board about, again, some pretty rudimentary plans thus far. Again, we're highly dependent upon some of the things that um, health departments will will bring to us okay um, we'll shift down to um, human resources and mrs. Galdo's presentation thank you um, so I just wanted to give you an update on hiring uh, this is our busy season for us for as in terms of hiring um, so uh, for student positions we have the uh, thanks something we have the um, summer sports camp in uh, Summer maintenance workers we're interviewing right now, so we're offering, going to offer a position to our high school students. Um, and as far as professional positions, we are currently interviewing for the physics contract and the ninth grade science contract at the high school. And at Murray Avenue, we're interviewing for the certified school nurse for Donald Lieberg's replacement and for the long-term sub uh, sixth grade English. Um, for the support positions that we're looking to fill, uh, we have uh, Cindy Martino's position as administrative assistant. So. Um, upcoming, we'll be looking to get to uh, uh, hire again a long-term sub uh, for the certified school nurse at the high school, and as well as a long-term uh, school cancer at Pine Road for uh, Ms. Dalhan, who's gone on sabbatical, and uh, for a couple of LTS learning support positions at Pine Road. Okay. Um, as far as public relations update, I want to give you a c c uh, quick update on what we're doing in that arena. Um, we're currently getting the word out about working uh, the musical. Uh, which the high school drama club is going to present uh, via a pay-per-view uh, event uh, March 13th to 16th. Um, so working is based on the Studs uh, Turkle novel um, where he interviewed, uh, you know, people who had uh, positions and to fill, you know, find out what they felt about their uh, life and their jobs. Uh, so it's going to be a collage of uh, spoken and sung uh, performances uh, that are presented. Very exciting. Um, and tickets are available uh, through the Lower Mullen High School website and also on the main website webpage. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so for the COVID-19 response, I just want to give you a qu quick update on what's going on with that. Uh, as, Mr. as Dr. David Heiser mentioned, um, we did have a clinic on April 24th. Uh, 100 students participated uh, in that uh, first clinic. Um, and uh, a second dose will be administered on May 15th. 
and uh, many thanks to Eric's uh, Oryx shop and uh, Mark Ost, our former alumni who uh, hosted that pharmacy, that event for us. And we had many volunteers turn out to both, uh, you know, uh, administer shots and to help people through the process. Um, uh, the County Health Department also asked that we make our community aware of that there is a, uh, a walk-up uh, J&J uh, vaccine clinic at uh, St. John's Episcopal Church in uh, Norristown. So this, you do not have to re re pre-register for this. You can just walk up and uh, get the J&J &J shot. That's for uh, those who are 18 and older. Okay. And as to going back to public relations for a second, I wanted to uh, tell you that um, this summer you can look forward to, we'll be uh, publishing the second year uh, progress report on our strategic plan goals. And we'll be uh, sending out the annual report for the, the current school year. So that'll be coming this summer. Uh, we'll get to give you an update on what happened this year and share a lot of good uh, pictures with you and a lot of accomplishments for this year. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Gaudo. Mr. Giordano. Yes, I mentioned at a previous uh, board meeting that our extended school year program this will this year will run from July 6th through August 5th. Um, it is, uh, I just wanted to provide an update on that program. It is in person this year at all three buildings. We have a total of uh, 79 students, which is pretty typical for um, our summer program. Uh, typically all students do not show up since extended school year is not mandatory. Uh, we get somewhere in the 60s uh, every year. Same number of teachers this year in classrooms as last year and same number of power professionals. Maybe a few more power professionals because we have some students with, with personal care assistance um, that, that maybe not, did not attend our program before. And our PASA testing is, is currently underway. PASA is the Pennsylvania Alternative System of Assessment, which is an alternative to the PSSA assessments um, for our complex needs learners. 16 total students being assessed this year, and um, the window has been extended as it has been for PSSA, but we, are, um, we'll, we should be done by the end of May. Of course, they did choose this year to change the provider and the way in which this is um, administered, which makes it difficult, but it's, we're, it's, it's worked out well, and it's, um, we're getting there, so that's it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Giordano. Dr. Hilt? Good evening again. I'm just going to do a quick sound check, so if you want to take a 15-second break. battle between two very sneaky competitors. The first one is the Fox. Okay, and if anyone at home isn't able to hear, I'll just edit in the audio, but it should come through for people in the audience here and also at home. All right, uh, as typical for my monthly updates, I wanted to call attention to our tech tips for students and families. I wanna thank those students and families who have contributed their tech tips. And I also wanted to highlight uh, some of the assessments, data collection and data analysis that happens in the district, as has been mentioned a few times this evening and, and by Mr. Giordano just a few moments ago. We have uh, quite a few assessments and data collection tools that we use in the district. And uh, this is not an extensive, or this isn't an all encompassing list. This is, these are things that uh, my team and I wanted to highlight, but this is um, certainly not all of the assessments and data collection tools that we're using. So you can see access for English learners. That's our uh, English language proficiency assessment. The COGAT is the cognitive abilities test. As we've mentioned, PSSA and PASA, Keystone exams, advanced placement tests, GMAT and grade. These are all uh, assessments and data collection tools that involve technology. And this is the first year that we have done uh, many of these online exclusively. And thus far, uh, things have been going very well. And I'll, I'll mention some kudos in just a moment related to the testing. But uh, this uh, also calls attention to the fact that we certainly rely on technology, but to have technology in the hands of every student allows us to collect data and uh, deploy assessments like we've done without uh, distributing, collecting, cleaning, distributing, collecting, because we're able to uh, provide testing and data collection on student devices. 
As I mentioned, and those of you who viewed last month's have been waiting for a month for uh, the videos that I promised. So I've highlighted this over and over again simply because there is uh, technology consumption, which would be viewing videos, viewing content, and then there's also uh, creation, which I've really been focusing on, and uh, the creativity, and just the phenomenal job that students have been doing. You can see there's a dip in May because we're only five days into it, and I'll, I'll share the live data on, on another occasion, but as you can see, uh, students and teachers, staff and students have been creating thousands and thousands of videos, and I wanted to highlight two of them this evening. The first is, uh, and this is from uh, Chris Warren, get the support teacher at Pine Road, and I'll read the information about it. Uh, these are a few examples of the animal showdown shows that fourth and fifth graders created after researching two animals and creating storyboards to plan and organize their show. They are shared with K and first grade, so they can use them to watch during breaks and snacks and use them for their comparison and contrast activities. So these are uh, much longer than we have time for this evening. So I'll show you about two minutes from each. You'll get the idea and hopefully you'll enjoy this. So the first one is Michael K, fourth grader, and it's Fox versus Garter Snake. Of a battle between two very sneaky competitors. The first one is the Fox. But without two competitors, there will not be a challenge. The fox has met his match, introducing the garter snake. Yes, that sneaky scoundrel is competing against a sly fox. The garter snake usually appears as brown or black. It has three stripes, in the middle and on the side. That was our little introduction to the garter snake. All right, I'm just going to move ahead a little bit here so you can get the idea. Slender with pointed ears and an elongated muzzle. The fox is nocturnal, and we already stated that it comes out at night, but it may venture in the day. Foxes hear low frequency sounds, and they hear underground. They hear that so well that they dig underground to catch their prey. All right, so you learn a little bit about the garter snake, you learn a little bit about the fox. He goes into more details, and then we're going to see the conclusion of this competition and his public service announcement that he created. A battle between two very sneaky competitors. The first one is the Fox. School, school, clothes. Make sure you wear school appropriate, otherwise you will fall asleep. Tip number two, sleep. Make sure you sweep sleep well and rest before school day. Otherwise, you may fall asleep during class. Go to bed about an hour earlier than you would normally. If you follow these tips, everything will be good in school. Now, we're going to go back to our animal showdown. Time to announce the winner. There can only be one winner, and that winner is, drum roll please, the garter snake. Dun, dun, dun. The garter snake is small and sneaky, unlike the sly fox. Sorry, Mr. Fox. Looks like you're not as sly as you used to be. So you can see there's certainly a lot of creativity that went into this, and the public service announcement um, you know, certainly adds some variety to it. The second video clip is Josiah, a fifth grader, and this is Cheetah versus Velociraptor. So two very good choices. So we're going to watch a few seconds of this as well. Find out who will win next on Animal Showdown. Who will win the battle for the fastest? The cheetah, aka the greyhound of the desert, or the movie star Velociraptor? I don't know, but I want to find out. First off, let's look at the cheetah. At weighing up to 160 pounds, this mammal prefers to live in Iran, Africa, and India. They prefer grasslands where they can camouflage, though. You've met our first competitor, the cheetah. 
now let's meet the Velociraptor. The Velociraptor is a genus of a dromaeosaurid theropod dinosaur. The Velociraptor can also be classified as a reptile. Now that may not be enough information to make this decision, but we're going to get some audience participation before I reveal the exciting conclusion of cheetah versus velociraptor. So show of hands, if you believe that the cheetah, again based on the information that you've gotten, will be the, the victor. Okay, how about the velociraptor? Okay, for those of you at home, overwhelmingly velociraptor, let's see what happens here. So uh, again, a, w a wonderful example of the work that's being done at Pine Road, very creative. And those of you who, who chose God, Cheetah, next? well An done. Animal show. In honor of today, which I had to be reminded earlier, I changed this from May kudos to May the 4th be with you kudos for the Star Wars fans in the crowd. And a few. Uh, Mr. Cole, Ms. McMullen, Ms. Dilks, and Mr. Boudreau. Uh, those are Pine and Murray Avenue administrators for the coordination, the work that you've done uh, preparing staff and students for the PSSAs. Uh, the tech department played a very small role in that, and certainly your coordination and communication has uh, really helped make this a smooth uh, testing period. And Pine Road and Murray Avenue teachers and staff, instructional coaches, and technology team for the same reasons. It's uh, a large undertaking to have uh, hundreds of students per day taking an assessment. The coordination and preparation that goes into that is, uh, is certainly appreciated. And if you've noticed, hopefully you have, an improvement in the sound, I'd like to thank Mr. Haldeman, uh, Lower Moreland High School, for his assistance, not only with the board meetings uh, setups, but also his work with the students, the tech crew, and staff to ensure the performances and events look and sound great. So thank you to uh, those staff members for your continued contributions to the district. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Mr. Hyland. All right, that's gonna be a tough act to follow with those videos, but uh, here tonight to uh, just give you a little bit of an update on our spring sports season. Uh, at the high school, we, be, we will be concluding in the next two weeks. Uh, our coaches, athletes, parents continue to be very flexible with all the changes uh, within the scheduling that are occurring throughout the year. Uh, the school nurses continue to do a great job working with the county to help determine if we need to pause a program or if we're able to continue moving forward. Uh, for some updates on our teams, uh, our boys tennis team won the SOL Freedom Division Championship uh, this spring. First round of districts will be this Thursday with the finals hopefully here on Monday the 10th. Uh, I would also like to congratulate Sam Yoon and Mark Bartoszewski who won the doubles championship this uh, past Friday. They actually defeated two other students from Lower Moreland, uh, Kevin Wang and Mahir Ram. And Mark and Sam will represent Lower Moreland in the District 1 doubles tournament uh, in two weeks. Uh, our senior Paige Malpezzi recorded her 100th goal for the lacrosse program, uh, which is a pretty big accomplishment uh, on senior day last Monday. Uh, that's an even more incredible accomplishment considering she missed two seasons, uh, one due to COVID last year and another um, due to a season ending injury two years ago. So uh, pretty in uh, incredible feat for Paige to score 100 goals in essentially 40 games. <laughs> Uh, our unified track and field team, they've uh, completed in their first two meets. Uh, they defeated Upper Dublin on Monday 426 in a meet that we hosted here at Lower Moreland. Uh, unified track and field is a fully inclusive co-ed program which brings students together uh, with and without disabilities. 
They practice and train together, and uh, they, they compete as equal teammates. Uh, our home meet last week was uh, an incredible event. Um, the, the coaches, the parents, the volunteers of the event made it a special day for our 11 athletes involved uh, with the unified track meet. Uh, next Monday, they travel up to Springfield High School for the regional meet, and if we do well there, we go to a virtual state meet after that. Um, spring sports in Murray Avenue are in full swing. Uh, they're in the heart of their schedule. Uh, today, our, tomorrow's track meet actually was postponed due to another school needing to pause uh, for a week. And then the baseball and softball teams are, are you know, playing about two games a week currently. Uh, and then finally, I do want to send a uh, sincere thank you to our tennis coach, Jeanette Hausman. Uh, Coach Hausman informed me last week that along with retiring from teaching, she is going to retire from the tennis program um, after 30 years of running both the boys and girls programs. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working for her, with her for the last four years, and she truly is a, uh, a coach who is dedicated to her student athletes. Uh, she represented our school at the district level and provided a powerful voice for a lot of small schools in, the, in our region. So if she's watching um, at home, Coach, thank you. And that is it for our sports update. If anybody has any questions. Now, I, w I want to just take a moment and thank Mr. Highland for his efforts in uh, tackling the charge of bringing unified sports to, uh, to um, Lower Moreland. It was pretty special to be out there and see that, um, that program and its inaugural year um, get off the ground. So thank you and thank you to all of our co-ed athletes in that program. It was uh, quite something special and we hope to build on that throughout uh, other multiple seasons as we, as we go through. Thank you. Okay, that's the end of our presentations for this evening. Um, we're going to go down through and just share with the board uh, a number of motions. As you can see in the personnel section, we have quite a lengthy list of, of those. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, many of those are uh, re-up contracts, annual contracts, and so forth. So, Ms. Gowda, would you just summarize some of those? I know most of those say the sa some of those say the same thing with just, just some different names attached to those. Certainly. So, um, items A through G are, are independent contractors who provide services to the district. And uh, what we do is we add 3% uh, uh, to the contract uh, if the budget allows, which um, I consult with Mr. Gwynn on that, and uh, he I said it did. Um, so, these are uh, Mary Kate Wright as school psychologist, Reggie Candido as a school psychologist, um, Margaret Kreutzer as a, a community counselor at Murray Avenue, um, Mary Kachaba as a community counselor at the high school, uh, Freemi Levy as a school psychologist, um, Jimmy Amaro and uh, Chelsea Foley as uh, Wilson uh, tutor uh, consultants. So those are uh, being re asked, being sought to re-up re for this coming school year. Um, item H is to a renewal of the contract between ourselves and uh, substitute teacher services. Um, STS is the entity that we contract with for um, all our per diem teacher subs, as well as a number of aides, uh, security assistants, greeters, and so forth. Um, so we are looking to add an additional 3% to the uh, rate for the security assistants, greeters, and aides. Um, item I is. Uh, the re, uh, re upping of the contract between our, ourselves and uh, general health care resources. Uh, this is another agency that we uh, seek out for uh, special education aides, as well as uh, Autumn J Delta T group. Uh, that's, we have a number of aides through them also. Um, Autumn K is a renewal of the contract uh, between us and Beata. Um, we have a contract with Be Beata um, to help staff um, our support. Uh, staff nurses uh, to help our uh, certified school nurses as they're doing contract tracing. They're um, working on the, in the school nurse's office. Um, they also help us with our uh, staff insurance testing program. And the contract is being renewed at a, a additional rate of 25 cents an hour. Um, U.S. Medical Staffing, uh, Adam L, is another uh, agency who we contract with for special education assistance. Item M is a contract between us and renewal of a contract between us and Cardinal Point Homeland Security uh, for a security system assistant who uh, splits his time between Murray Avenue and High School. Um, that is a, an additional 50 cents per hour. Um, item N, O, and P are essentially the same. There are three contracts uh, with the same agency. Um, 
of Vena Healthcare. Uh, they asked for three contracts because um, they have separate, they have uh, offices in uh, Feasterville, Wincote, and Jenkintown that have separate tax ID numbers. So that's why they needed um, separate contracts. But this Avena Healthcare uh, works very closely with the uh, CHOP Policy Lab uh, to, on the uh, assurance testing program, the COVID assurance testing program. And when we needed uh, nurses for the junior prom testing uh, last week, and we'll need them again in uh, June for the senior prom testing uh, for the students and their guests who are going to, to those proms. Um, they provide nurses for that. And it, it's essential that we contract with somebody who knows the testing program because there's a, a three hour video that people, the nurses have to watch and then they have to get uh, be skills tested uh, to make sure they can administer the test correctly because there is, you know, when they go to, um, you know, there's uh, mixing of the swabs with reactive agents. There's, you know, a complicated process involved with that. So we do need to make sure that we have qualified uh, nurses who are able to do that. So. Um, that's why we contracted with them. Um, item Q is uh, renewing the long-term disability and life insurance policy uh, with uh, CM Regent Solutions. Um, it's at no, in create, create, no increase in the plan rates for this year. Um, item R is a nurse, uh, for Judith Fry, for ESY program uh, from July 5th to August 5th. Um, we do have a, a nurse on site with our ESY students uh, at Pine Road because, um, you know, they have special, um, sp special needs and medical needs that we need to be um, aware of and attentive to. Um, item S is uh, approval of Declan Campbell. He's a, a second year maintenance worker. We'd like to, uh, some of our student high, you know, uh, high school student worker that we'd like to bring back. Um, so we'll have other student workers who are uh, going through the interview process now, but we uh, knew that Declan Campbell uh, worked for us uh, uh, you know, not last year, we didn't have a program last year, but uh, the year before that he uh, did a great job for us at the high school and we'd like to bring him back. And item T is a uh, request approval of an FMLA for Megan Cavarda, uh, one of the emotional support teachers at the high school. Uh, she's gonna, she's seeking to be out for the first marking period, uh, which ends November 5th. And uh, item U is a full year uh, FMLA and then unpaid leave. Uh, for Caitlin Thelmuth, one of the learning support teachers at Pine Road, so she will be out for the entire uh, next school year. Any questions for Mrs. Gallo? I know that's a pretty lengthy list. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Gallo. Mrs. Drennan, curriculum. The first item is request approval to attend professional meetings as attached. One of the professional meetings that um, is being sought is for Penny Kittle, who is um, sort of a respected, um, I won't use the word guru, but professional developer in the area of ELA. And so we are engaging with her through the IU and having our teachers participate in um, a small capacity in June and then in a larger capacity in August with two presentations that she's making. Her focus really is on uh, reinvigorating sort of an interest, if not a love of reading among secondary students. So giving um, students choice when it comes to reading, bringing back sort of um, and fostering this engagement with literature in a different way. We are seeing a lack of interest in reading and free time um, with our students most recently. So she'll focus on that. The other workshop that she's presenting has to do with integrating um, diverse literature in the classroom and facilitating conversations around it. And so on a larger scale, our teachers in grades seven, six through 12, I'm sorry, will participate in that in August. So this is one of the first participants requesting to attend that. There will be more to come. The second item is requesting the approval of the contract uh, through the MCIU for VHS Consortium. Um, VHS is virtual high school. We've had a long-standing relationship with VHS. It has afforded our students the opportunity to take classes and things that we just don't offer. And so there have been a really diverse, um, you know, interest, there's a diverse interest level in their programming that ranges from Mandarin to, um, for example, AP Computer Science and AP Psychology. Historically, when we've seen a large number of our students become interested through VHS in a program, we have sought to then bring that program into our school. So AP Comp Sci and AP Psychology are two examples of that. 
Um, we have had teachers of ours who have participated in VHS as, as teachers, which allows us to have additional students, but this year the contract is for the student seats only, um, and we value our participation in the VHS program. Any questions for Mrs. Drennan? Okay. Thank you. So under uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, just a quick summary, uh, Dr. Hill, if you can pull, yes, the website up. Um, we have placed the um, agenda and associated details from the meeting and some of the documents that we utilized inherently through that meeting. If you would click on that meeting agenda for us, Dr. Hill. Thank you. Currently, our uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council membership is 38. Um, based on conversations we had it here with the board, we did, I did put an invitation out to LMTEA to see if any other membership would like to, to join. Uh, so I'm, I'm waiting to see if we can uh, build on that, most especially in some of those areas that, that I know were brought up at, at one of our more recent meetings. Um, the council, we talked a little bit about the purpose and the function and uh, had an activity from the start with a start doing, stop doing. And it was really based on five belief statements and that was, those belief statements were taken from the resolution that was adopted by the board back in February. Talked about some of our, our core beliefs and the intention of the activity was to go into and look at each of those and based on those belief statements, what's one thing uh, we need to stop doing? as a school district and what's one thing we need to start doing as a school district and allowed voices inside from each of the groups and we were broken into five different groups across the 38 individuals and collecting some data that we hope to be useful data and anecdotal data that we hope to utilize as we build our action plan. Um, Baltimore Williams worked a little bit with talking about um, some cultural proficiency as we also sh shared some snapshot enrollment snapshot data um, across the, di the district just to give the, the council members just an idea of um, our diversity as it exists here inside of Lower Moreland Township School District. And we ended with a belonging activity. And again, uh, we, we, we talked a little bit about what it means to belong in Lower Moreland Township and what are some of those things that we are doing or not doing or the things that are intentional or unintentional that are done upon us to not allow us to belong inside that school district. Again, to start to build some of the data points that we can utilize as we say, um, you know, some of this data and, and some of the action steps that we can align to hopefully improving upon the quality of things that we're doing and the intentionalness of us to uh, create a, a, a more sense of inclusion and a more sense of belonging across and inside the school district. I did, if you could just scroll down one second, Dr. Hilt. We did leave the group with, um, and certainly any of the council members here this evening or that are listening in, um, one of the things I did ask them to do is to think about a focus area that they would like to attach themselves to. I noticed uh, today I was in, and some members have already uh, assigned themselves to a group, wonderful. Um, others, please do so. Um, the expectation would be by the time we meet next time we have that. and. Um, gives them an opportunity to be inside a group and the intentionalness of what we want to do with our SMART goals is, as was mentioned earlier in, in the meeting, is to be very intentional across the next three to five years with an action plan. So each of those focus areas would have an attached goal. Inside of that goal would be a number of different ap action steps, timelines, um, and associations to whom is responsible and targets uh, of meeting for each of those action, ste action steps along the way. So as we build momentum with this council through the next coming months, um, our, our, our hope is that we provide enough data to the council so that they can start to look inside of that. And that brings us up to the um, under item A is requesting an approval to administer panorama equity and inclusion survey. So. Let me just give you a little bit of description. So most recently, our school district certainly increasing focus on creating school community that ensures equity and fosters inclusion. And more than ever, specific and measurable goals around equity and inclusion need to be at the core of our district's strategic planning and priorities. 
This is Gaudu talked about us wrapping up our, our second year of our strategic plan as it relates to a number of areas. Our expectation would be that this plan dovetails right into that strategic plan at the start of next school year so that we have a fully inclusive strategic plan that's also taking into account diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and as I mentioned, um, the action plan will be focused on creating a culturally proficient staff, culturally proficient curriculum, policies and procedures, community and family engagement, and culture, climate, and safety. So therefore, the district is interested in collecting, um, collecting on behalf of the DEI Council what student, teacher, and staff perceptions of equity and inclusion in school are. Student and educator voices are powerful indicators of how our schools are doing on the journey to create more inclusive and equitable learning environments. Without these data, our schools cannot, cannot truly benchmark their progress toward ensuring that each and every student feels included and equipped to succeed. By asking students, teachers, and staff to reflect on their, their experiences of equity and inclusion in our schools, we as leaders can gather actionable data to understand and improve upon the racial and, cl and cultural climate. The Panorama Equity and Inclusion Survey being proposed for use provides school districts with a clear picture of how students, teachers, and staff are thinking and feeling about these critical topics. The survey can help our schools and track the progress of equity initiatives through the lens of stakeholder voice, identify areas for celebration and improvement, inform professional development, and signal the importance of equity and inclusion in the community. The student topics that are part of the survey were developed in partnership with RIDES, with the RIDES project at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, RIDES standing for Reimagining Integration, Diverse and Equitable Schools. The Panorama research team built off the student topics to develop the teacher and staff topics, which intentionally parallel the student topics to reveal similarities or differences in student and adult perceptions. The survey exists, exists as a series of scales or groups of survey questions that work together to measure a single topic, i.e. belonging. The district is recommending surveying students grades 6 through 12 and all staff K through 12 and our intention would be to have passive permission used with the students, meaning parents will have a window of time to view the, su the survey, which we will post publicly. Parents will have the opportunity to then opt students out of taking the survey if they feel so inclined. We expect the survey to take really no longer than 10 to 15 minutes, and we would administer the online survey during school time, notably probably during a win period in our schools. So um, inside the agenda is the... Um, is the panorama survey. I would ask our, our board to please take a look. I know a number of you were part of that council and may have already had an opportunity to do so. I've asked our council to also look through that and give us feedback. Um, our intention would be to administer that in the month of May if fully approved by you as a board to do so. Okay, any questions? Where is the survey, Dr. David Heiser? It is attached to the, uh, inside the agenda. The agenda that we're using for DEI. It's not in the packet, it's in the, no, it's attached in the DEI agenda. I'll on need to get you that agenda. That ag the agenda that we're using for the DEI council. Right. I'll, s I'll resend that out. Okay, but I can, I can access it on the, you will be able to once I post it. Okay. All right. Okay. I do not see any building and grounds for this evening, but under business and finance, Mr. McGuinn, would you take the board through A through D? Certainly. Uh, I'd like to uh, request approval of item A, which is our checklist dated 426. Uh, item B and item C go together. This is a uh, requesting approval for a stipulation to settle with HCR Manicare Properties. Uh, this was the final um, tax parcel that uh, we had with Fox Rothschild. Uh, this went in front of a judge, Judge Rothstein, uh, and we were able to negotiate a settlement. Um, and then the item C is an agreement between the two entities not to uh, go for a reassessment for the next two years. 
Um, again, this number is a reduction in total assessment. However, these numbers are factored into our budget numbers. Uh, so we are, um, while we're um, not necessarily happy with the uh, agreement, there was rationale for it. Uh, we are happy that this is the last uh, parcel that we have uh, under Fox Rothschild that we're uh, uh, contesting. So this should um, conclude that piece. And then item D, uh, we're asking for the approval of the 21-22 fee structure for our before and after school program or Kinderlinks program uh, at, the at the amount shown. And these prices, we've made the decision to keep the prices the same uh, as they were for the 2021 school year. And in fact, uh, for the majority, well, from September through March, those prices were halved as we were in a hybrid structure. So we only charged half of those amounts per month uh, because students were only coming in two days a week. Now that we are back fully in person, uh, we've upped that number. And in fact, we've had a few more student enrollments. So the program is, is growing. It's certainly not where it was uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, but again, it's another sign of um, normalcy, which we've talked about uh, a few times tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGuinn. There is no student services items nor technology items this evening under school board. This is Gaudo. Would you take item A, uncompensated leave? Certainly. This policy. Is, this is, yeah, this is the second uh, reading of the policy on uncompensated leaves. Um, what we're do trying to do with that policy is just to ch uh, change the dates in the policy. It had uh, the start of school starting September. Uh, when we changed our calendar to the start of starting August, we needed to update the policy to reflect that change. So it's a simple date change. Okay, and under item B, um, had some, I had sent this out to the board earlier, but um, we are seeking approval for an agreement with Diligent Corporation for Board Docs LT. Um, board Docs is a software service that uh, currently our board policies already uh, sit inside. Uh, what is common among most school districts uh, right now is an organization system so that we can place agendas and backup materials inside of that and so they're readily uh, uh, available to the public and they're very organized. When we attend these types of meetings, we could be utilizing the screen, publishing those, opening up the board docs. People could be on their phones already having backup and agenda items in front of them while the meeting is going or have at least had opportunities to see all of the backup materials um, uh, to which um, the agenda items are attached. Um, it, it, it lends itself to just so much more transparency among information uh, for our community and an ease for, I think, all of you in that everything's uh, found in one spot. There aren't separate agendas and separate items there. There is a cost, uh, and that cost is an annual fee, at least this year's fee of $2,700 for that. I don't know what it will be next year, but um, it is on the lower scale. There are a scale that goes anywhere from 2,700 to 10,000, and the Cadillac version was not necessary for us. We use it at Eastern for the JOC meetings, and it is phenomenal. Yeah. We've also started using it, I don't know, several months ago at the MCIU, and uh, it, it makes the meeting go a lot smoother as well. Yeah. So. Yeah, it, it, it certainly should help, and I think it brings the community in and, and into the information as well um, for all those types of things. So. Are there any discussion items with regard to the board only? Any other things you want to bring up before we go into comments, public comments? If not, we'll move into public comments. Again, please register uh, if you want to speak. Each speaker is asked to speak approximately three minutes. State your name, your address, speak for three minutes. It's a comment section, not a question section. If you have questions, Please send them to the board or to Dr. David Heiser. Thank you. Is there anybody in the public that, uh, in the auditorium right now that has not signed up? I don't have your name. I have three names down, and I just call you in order. These are the only three. 
Is there anybody else that's speaking this evening? Okay, so I'll, how about I call you as the fourth one? And then you can just come down and just state your name when, when you come down up front, okay? Okay, you're welcome. So we have uh, Helene Landis. Yes. Uh, yeah, you might. I'm a little short. Yeah, you can pull that. You probably can adjust. There you go. Okay. You got it. And I'll sit. That's okay. I'm on? Okay. Six months ago, our community was suffocated by a racial tech scandal. As we all sat here at the top of our suburban, mostly white hilltop, thinking racism was not a problem in our community. That was mistake number one. As we all know, four boys were involved in a private text that contained inexcusable racial language. That text was illegally doxed out to several websites. That was mistake number two. For anyone who's not familiar with doxing, I will give you the definition. Doxing is the search for an illegal publishing of private or identifying information about an individual on the internet, typically with malicious intent. To further clarify, doxing is a fourth degree felony in the state of Pennsylvania. Organizers and members of the group Pop the Bubble participated in doxing and sharing of photos and screenshots to various groups. Two of the candidates running for school board are active members of the group Pop the Bubble. Reading through the comments of the early days of this organization, it is filled with hate, not unity. Just so all of you know, the boys involved in that text want to take their words back. Speaking of taking words back, Mr. James Lee has deleted many of the comments he made in January on social media. I guess he realized his words would make him unelectable to this school board. How lucky for Mr. Lee that he was able to clean up his social media profile. However, not before his comments were screenshotted. The boys were not given the luxury of cleaning up their social media profiles before their private texts were doxxed. And Ms. Halpern Lipschultz, your convertible mom comments have been screenshotted. Do you remember comparing these boys to the Columbine shooters? Exactly what horrors were you hoping would happen to their families by making that statement? Are we really a community who would elect members to the school board who would actively try to destroy the education of four of our kids? and bring death threats to their families. I do not say this to ruin lives or to destroy reputations like they did. I say it to highlight the hypocrisy of those that claim to want a united community while they are tormenting families and notifying their potential colleges. Pop the bubble right now today has the first and last names of the minors that were involved in that text on their website right now. There are board members who are members of Pop the Bubble. The behavior of this group and those two school board candidates is divisive and not unifying. How will they feel if we doxed out screenshots of all of their online behavior from January, February, and March? I have not done that because I do not have evil in my heart. Ms. And I have no interest in ruining anyone's life. Ms. Ms. Landis, your three minutes are up, if you could wrap it I up. I have 10 seconds. Thank you. Our community needs to do better. We need to become a racially equitable community that protects all of our residents. This includes children who make mistakes. As we claim to lift up members of all racial groups, we cannot do so while trampling on families who are grieving. These boys made public apologies for their behavior. They want their words back. Now I expect all of the self-righteous adults who sought to destroy them and their families, I want them to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lenz. Next speaker, Danilo Diaz. Good evening. 
uh, everyone. Um, so I, I was not aware that questions were not allowed, um, so I will follow up with those questions um, uh, later. But I, um, I did have a couple comments I just wanted to make. One is a, a simple one. Um, uh, just uh, I, I will, you know, encourage the, uh, the board, the administration to use systems. This is more of a technical question or a suggestion to use systems like user voice uh, to capture the kind of like the, the, the desires of the community. Uh, it's a system where you can put uh, ideas and then people can vote on those ideas, you know, like the German stuff, you know, uh, it's something that the community wants and, and people can, can vote that up and down and you can get a sense, uh, a life sense of the community. It's, it's used commonly in software development. Um, it's something that, that, that we use all the time, so um, just encourage you to, to, to do that. Um, I, um, because I don't get to ask a question, I just want to make, make a comment on, on diversity. I um, just want to really caution the board uh, and the administration as, as you're going through this journey of diversity, right? To be very careful because diversity is, using, is being used today as a way to, to not really provide uh, equality in outcomes, right, uh, which is what we all desire. Um, as an immigrant myself, um, I've been blessed um, by what this country has offered me. It's, it's, it's been hard, um, uh, not for racial issues that I have, mainly because it's hard to be away from your culture. Right? It's hard to be away from, from, from your family members. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm very concerned as a citizen, as a, as a community member, to see all the divide that, um, that some, some experts are, are calling for. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested to, to look at this survey uh, to see. Um, I'm specifically talking about things like critical race theory, which are extremely divisive, uh, just, just, just harmful um, to uh, all around. So I, I, will, I will really caution um, you guys to, um, uh, to, to not fall into that trap uh, in the sake of diversity. Uh, it's very easy to think that we're doing the right things um, uh, when we really are not. Uh, when it comes to that, you know, <laughs> we definitely need it uh, in, in the district. You know, we, if you look around at the, uh, at the staff members, right, I, I have two daughters, uh, and uh, one was telling me like that, you know, I just don't, well, she's saying poppy because that's what she calls me. Uh, I, you know, I, when I'm struggling with something, you know, she loves her teachers, but there's no one that looks like her. And I don't think there's really an excuse for that. Um, and I've talked to, to, to some members of the board, you know who you are, I don't have to mention, uh, very open um, to, to, to feedback, which I appreciate. Um, but it's definitely, it's definitely uh, uh, apparent that there seems to be a lack of awareness. Um, uh, uh, not, not that there's an issue, but that um, Perhaps there's some hiring practices that are hindering uh, certain groups of people to, to join uh, the staff. I know personally of Latino uh, candidates, and by the way, notice I, I said I said Latino and, and not Latinx, because Latinx is not welcomed by the Latino community, but yet we are being forced to use it. And by the way, we do have a general neutral way of saying Latino, it's Latin, right, with an E, right, which is something that all of us identify with. Mr. Um, Diaz, Mr. Diaz, your three minutes are up. If you can wrap up. Yeah, just wrap it up uh, quickly. Um, but I, I know personally of, of, of several diverse candidates that have applied for Spanish-speaking positions and have not even gotten a call uh, from the district. Qualified people, right? So I will, I will encourage you to look, you know, before consultants, to look just deeper into yourselves. Like, why, why is it that either we're not attracting or we're just not hiring, right? I don't want quotas completely against quotas. I just, I, I just want us to know why is it that we're not attracting uh, representation, not from our community here, but from the region, which is where we attract uh, hires. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Laura Peters. Hello, I want to thank everybody for the time to speak today. I recognize it's been a very long meeting, so I'll try to keep this brief. I'm here today um, because I've been concerned about how, since January, this school board and district has been used as a platform um, to basically continue divisive rhetoric and not go towards solutions, towards social justice. I have a background in counter-extremism. Uh, I've operated all around the world in stabilization operations in um, disenfranchised uh, populations. And right now my focus in criminal analysis is to look at influence operations 
and how social media can be used to propagate misinformation and false narratives that create a very divisive situation that can cause extremism and promote people towards radicalization. Well, what I've seen since January, when the adults in this community encouraged illegal activity by promoting the doxing of private communication of minors in social media, that then promoted a false narrative that went out way beyond this community, that then promoted, and I have this in a documented timeline, several threats of life to students in this, in this community and their family members, character assassination and public shaming that continued to be inflamed in social media that was promoted by adults and then respected community members using their own platforms, including county commission and candidacy for this school board to shame family members, question their parenting, questioning and calling racist, making racist gang comments about students here without ever having met them, never having one communication with them. That is a very toxic culture. And I know from studying extremism and radicalization, this is the pathway to create divisive communities and create actions that could be very harmful and damaging. I'm extremely concerned that we are not instead promoting social justice as in aligned with the fantastic examples we have in this country of leaders that promote reconciliation, mediation, and honest communication. It is very concerning to me that we're promoting and advocating that our youth use social media to influence the opinions of people without talking to them, without getting to know them, without allowing opportunities for reconciliation. The school board has done a phenomenal job of promoting opportunities for more inclusiveness. Please do not use this school board to continue to promote harmful communication that is tearing apart the community. I am telling you, as an expert in counter-extremism, these efforts in allowing for this communication platform is absolutely teaching our children illegal behaviors to be vindictive, defame people, and dox them. These are all illegal behaviors. Ms. We Peters, cannot promote that. Ms. Peters, you've reached the three minutes. If you could wrap no it up. No problem. I want to say thank you and also happy teachers appreciation. The teachers have done a phenomenal job in this community, and I just hope that we can continue to have open conversations and inclusiveness in, in all of our social justice platforms. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker. If you could just state your name, first and last name for me, please. Juliet Yavis. Juliet? Yes, J-U-L-I-E-T. And, and last name? Yavis, Y-A-V as in Victor, A-S. Got it. Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to introduce myself to the board and the rest of the community members. Hello, my name is Juliet Yavis. I am a current student at Lower Moon High School and I am a sophomore. Keeping with the community's desire for better communication and transparency between it and the board, the public should be given access to a written format of public question asking and responses. As this is not yet available, some of my fellow community members and I have collected some comments from others to share with you today. This first comment is from an LM parent. Linking to letters that denounce violence against AAPI does not help one learn about AAPI heritage. This next comment is also from an LM parent. Given the recent history of AAPI discrimination in Lower Moreland schools and the general significance of AAPI history and heritage month, I am appalled at the lack of resources posted on the website. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. 
let me restart that comment. This is from an LM parent. Given the recent history of AAPI discrimination in Lower Moreland schools and the general significance of AAPI History and Heritage Month, I am appalled at the lack of resources posted on the website. The truth is 20.43% of our students have an AAPI heritage, thereby giving appropriate links to both our students and the general public can only increase awareness and sensitivity. I believe that the board is able to find resources as demonstrated by earlier presentations by some board members. I believe that an action the board can take to address this, links including national AAPI resources, OCA, Viet Lead, KAAGP, AAPI, Mon Montgomery County. This next comment is from a community member. I question the nature of the board's commitment to the DEI, considering that a board member who is directly linked to the racist text incident is not on the DEI council. And this final comment is from a community member. I believe that school board candidates should make their platforms public, not hide them in private Facebook groups. I believe some incumbent members of the board, whom I am not naming, are not making their stances public. Thank you. The next regular scheduled board meeting will be on Wednesday because of the election, May 10th, 2021, at 7 o'clock. Do I have a motion for adjournment? Nineteenth. I'm sorry. It, the nineteenth. It, it is May nineteenth. Right. It's it's Wednesday, May nineteenth. Right. Yes. What? No. Do we do we end the end, hmm? end the meeting and they can speak next time? Let her speak. Hmm? Let her speak. I don't know problem. Okay. Excuse me. Excuse me. There were two, you have two members th there that are speaking. Is that what you said? Okay, well, none of you are on the sign up sheet as the instructions were to at the beginning of the meeting. No. The, the, the instructions were to come and, and, and on the agenda to come down to the podium and just sign in down here at the podium, at the, at the microphone. Okay. So, Dr. Cohen, do you, excuse me. You were, excuse me. We're, we're, we're trying to work something out here so I can give you some directions. We, do, we do, do you want them to speak? Would you like to allow them to speak? Yes. Okay. You can speak, but going forward, if you want to speak, you come down to the beginning of the meeting, sign the form and put your address in. It's for a comment only, not a question. Okay, so let's have some order to this. When you come down, if you can just state your name just like the last lady did, and I'll take your name down and you have three minutes for your, for your comment, okay? Okay, so who would like to start? I'm going to do my best here. Do I twist this? You can take it off. It take might be easier just to hold the microphone in your hand. Oh. There you go. I feel like I'm going to sing karaoke. Okay, um, can I, your name, please. My name is Serena Nguyen, and I am an alum of the Lower Moreland Township School District. Thank you for letting me speak today. I did sign up earlier outside, but I guess next time we'll come down here. Um, my comment to the board is honestly I did I thought you did a great job at hosting 38 uh, DEI council members at the D, the first DEI meeting and um, last time I know we spoke briefly about having more members from the community join and I was just I think that I using the same method it would work for uh, having more people join the DEI Council if we opened it up to the community. Because I've been in uh, 
meetings with about 100 people using similar breakout room methods, and it was able to flow pretty smoothly. Um, my other comment, which regrettably I think the first speaker is not here to hear, um, is just quickly pointing out that we don't even have a website, and I don't think any of our students' names are on it, and I don't know, like, we really do want to work with the board. I am here saying that sincerely. We never mean to disrespect any of you. And all of the questions that we have, we'll send them to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker from the group there. Hi, could, my name is Gabrielle Janofsky. Um, could, Gabrielle, could you just spell her last name for me? J-A-N-O-V-S-K-Y. Thank you. Um, just to introduce myself really fast, I'm an alumni, graduated in 2017. I have two brothers who are in the school district, one of which is autistic and is going to need accommodations for that. Um, you know, I guess I just want to start by saying very honestly, I'm very nervous for my youngest brother to start our, attending our school district. I'm very, very nervous about how students in our school district will treat him because of my own experiences in our school district. Um, you know, I am non-binary and queer. If you don't know what that means, I urge you to look it up. Um, my experience being an openly queer person in our high school was very painful. Very, very painful. So even standing here today is very painful. So I guess I urge you all to take a moment to stop being politicians and really look at me as a human being. Like, please look at me as a human being and recognize I don't have an agenda here. I just want to see something better for our students. I want each and every single one of our students to feel safe in our schools. Um, in regards to the mental health addition of counselors, I think that's a great step. I really do. I was excited to see that. I really hope that Lower Moreland does not stop there and considers integration and an integration process to ensure that these kids are not bullying others for needing AIDS because that is something that does happen in our school district. Um, I also really hope that we take time to really further empower the teachers here who already know this change needs to happen by providing them with further training, further supports, and you know, my identity, for example, should not be a mystery to these kids. They should, it should not, being non-binary should not be a mystery to you. And I guess I say that since we're all bringing up our identities here, because you know, that is missed. When I went to Wisconsin, I I'm graduating from there right now, because I got in, from this high school. Um, you know, I realized there was a lot I didn't learn while growing up here, and I had a learning curve while out in the real world, and I made a lot of mistakes that I regret too. So I really hope that we give the tools that we need to these kids to be better people when they do leave these doors. And that's all we're here to do. That's it. And I'm going to keep showing up to make sure that you all get here and get there with our students because Lone Moreland's not going anywhere. I don't want it to go anywhere. I just want it to be better. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Next student from the group. Good evening, my name is Elizabeth Kokorin. I am a new student at Lower Moreland. I've only been a resident of culturally, fiscally, racially, and ethically diverse communities thus far, and I hope to strive to create Lower Moreland in such a manner to reinforce strong community, safety, and inclusivity. Part of my vision ties into why I'm a member of Pop the Bubble. I understand how messages may get lost in translation, so I would like to reinforce Pop the Bubble's mission and vision and ensure that we all care and love this community in its entirety. 
Our mission is to connect and uplift communities through bipartisan, inclusive, and equitable values. Pop the Bubble strengthens our community through collaborative efforts to encourage accountability and foster constructive conversations. Our vision, we envision culturally and academically enriched communities that empower their individual members, resulting in long-term social change and civic engagement through grassroots collaboration. I would like to add that Pop the Bubble does not have any members that are running for elected positions. We are made up of alumni, students, and other community members. We have the support, excuse me, we have the support of our parents, teachers, and classmates. Thank you so much for listening to my message. Thank you. Elizabeth, can you sp spell your last name for me? I'm sorry. K-O-K-O-R-I-N. Thank you. Is there any, one more speaker? Okay. Hi, so you're lucky. I am in fact the last student. My name is Michelle Marty. As some of you may know, I am on the DI Council um, and I am familiar with some of you. Um, I'm a junior at Lower Moreland and I've been here for about 12 years now. I grew up in this district. My brother graduated from here in 2012 and I have a very careful relationship with Lower Moreland. Um, from as far back as when my brother being in the school, he's recalled instances of bigotry towards white students because that was all that, uh, for the most part, that this school made up. Um, he recalled extreme violence toward the only gay student in his uh, graduating class, who has since, I believe, overdosed, but, I, but don't quote me on that. Um, he described raging drug problems. He described mental health, um, uh, students struggling with their mental health not being addressed, disabled students being picked on, um, and so on and so forth. It is really a trend that's been, that's uh, defied time, so to speak. Um, now, what the first speaker here addressed is very much an instance of white fragility. While we can admit that some of the white students here, for example, Gabby, and her, uh, as they described in their experience, and me have struggled in this district, um, we have to understand that through our efforts on, in the DEI Council, we must prioritize those affected by racism over our own reputations. Now, standing here before you, I don't care if you leak any of my messages from a January, February, March. I don't care. I have nothing to hide to you. I mean no harm to these families, but at the same time, I don't care about your emotions because I have friends that have cried in classes because of these incidents. I have friends who are deeply traumatized by the racism that they've endured here. Enduring racism is an expectation of graduating this school. Enduring any sort of prejudice is something that is more so a formality than anything else. Um, and I think that we need to recognize this as we're protecting these cishet white male students. Well, I'm sure that they're struggling mentally with the effects of, you know, very vile threats coming out into the public, we also have to realize that the First Amendment does have its limits and that we should not be putting, um, you know, free speech and such ahead of the safety of our students. Even though there was no measurable threats found legally, um, there were a lot of students that were impacted by this. <sighs> We need to stop protecting white, uh, white boys who are almost adults because I'm younger than every single one of these kids and I know that saying that I'm going to lynch students because I'm upset that my baseball season got canceled is not acceptable. We need to teach these students from a young age that accountability measures will be taken. Now I am here as a member of Pop the Bubble, but I'm also here as a student that wants the best for this community and that includes wanting the best for my peers and my, my families, children, and all the generations to come. I think we have so much potential, and I thank a lot of these board members for the great work that they did at the DI Council. That being said, we do need to do better in uh, preserving white fragility, and we need to help our students. Thank you. Thank you all for your comments. Do I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. Second. All in Second. favor, good. Adjourned. <laughs>